coming. And uh, I first heard about Christopher Boleyn, it was like uh, seven years ago or so when he was uh, being attacked by the police in the Chicago area. And, and then so from there he went over to Sweden because you don't get justice in America often. But we're very, I'm very pleased to have Christopher, Christopher here uh, to talk about who did 9-11. Um, and that's often what's avoided. They want to go about how did the building come down, blah, blah, blah. But let's find out really who did it. So thanks a lot. Thanks, Christopher. Good evening, everybody. Nice to see you all. It's, uh, I'm, I'm really glad that they were able to, uh, Tim was able to arrange this event on such short notice. Um, I've just, this is my first time back in the United States in seven years. Um, I, was, I was prosecuted after some undercover police came to my house in Hoffman States, Illinois. They attacked me and they tasered me and broke my arm in front of my family. And then they prosecuted me um, saying that I had assaulted them and resisted their arrest. Now these were uncover, undercover police that wore no uniforms and refused to identify themselves. But first let's start with the basics. I, my name is Christopher Bolin and I'm the author of uh, a book called Solving 9-11. Solving 9-11, The Deception That Changed the World. This is the, this is the main book. This is uh, 360 pages long and it presents the whole thesis of my work in very readable format. It's, uh, the layout is very easy on the eye, and, and it explains chapter by chapter who's, who's behind the 9-11 crime, the whole history of this kind of false flag terrorism, uh, who are the main people involved in it, and then it concludes with how they maintain the deception and how, for 13 years, how they, um, and the reason why I call it solving 9-11, because a lot of people don't realize this, but the crime of 9-11, for example, the, the murder of 2,700 people in New York City, was never investigated as a crime. There was no investigation. Because a criminal investigation starts with the evidence. And when the evidence, the evidence from the, the, the mass murder of 2,700 people at the World Trade Center, the only thing that was left in the crime scene was steel and dust. And right away, they began taking the steel away, cutting it into small pieces, mixing it with other scrap, and sending it to China on a slow boat, on a boat never to be seen again. And that is, though, however, the, the crime scene where 2,700 people were killed. And what's particularly appalling about the deaths of these 2,700 people is 250 of them jumped from the, from the towers. You saw some of them jumping. Because it was so incredibly hot up there, Above this, above this area where all this molten, molten iron was cooking, like on the 82nd floor of, the, of this tower number two, that these people broke the windows and just, they, they, it was like 200, 300 degrees Celsius inside the building. So they broke the windows and they were hanging off the side of the building, if you remember seeing that. And then they jumped. And a firefighter down below said, we, we can only wonder how bad it was up there that the better option was to jump. Well, so, there was no investigation. And so it, came, it, it fell upon me as an independent journalist working in Washington, D.C. to start an investigation, to pursue this investigation, because I could see that the mainstream media and the government were basically in cahoots to, get, to, to sell us a myth, to sell us a complete fabrication, a, a myth, basically. And, that we, and based on that myth, the country was going to war. In October, you know, in October 2001, we already went to Afghanistan before there was any investigation, and there was no investigation. Then, the, the, so the main book is this one, the, the Solving 9-11, The Deception That Changed the World. Now, there are two books in this Solving 9-11 set. It's called a set, because they have the same Library of Congress number, and they go together. The second book, I only have a picture, this is about the size of it. It's called Solving 9-11, The Original Articles. And as a journalist, I was writing weekly, weekly articles about 9-11, some years I wrote more, some years I wrote less. But I started in September 2001, because I happened to be in New York City that day, and passing through early in the morning. And it, 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 it I knew that this, this event was going to change my life, it was going to change our nation. So I began writing right away, and investigating. And uh, I wrote for, until 2006, until the police attack, and then I continued writing. You know, they, 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 they took away my income, I was fired from my job, I was prosecuted, and that's when 
that's when I started getting really serious about this. Then I, then I started writing the book. I went to Europe, and, and I, I, I realized that they were, trying to, they were trying to smear me, marginalize me. CNN called me an anti-Semite. Fox News called me an anti-Semite. And um, I'm neither. But, but that's what they do when, you, you know, when, you, when you're over the target, you get a lot of flack, basically. Now, this book contains a, a, a 130 articles that I wrote from September 2001 until the spring of 2012. This book came out in June 2012. And these, these articles are in chronological order. And so when you read these articles, you can see how the evidence and how the, how the thinking and the trail information leads to this inescapable conclusion that I come to in this book. And that's who's behind 9-11. I, I name the people. I describe how their history of doing this kind of thing. And I want to say, if you want to get, if, if you, I don't, don't have any of these copies with me because they arrived in California the day after I left. But if you, if you want to get a copy of the Solving 9-11, the original article, you would have to tell me, and I, and I have to write down your address, your phone number, and for $25, then I will send you one. One will be on the mail to you in two days. So that's how I have to handle that. And the third book I have up here, this is a book from a, a friend and a colleague named Jeff Gates. He was the... Uh, general counsel for the U.S. Senate Finance Committee in the 1980s um, under Russell Long and Huey Long's son. And, and he explains how this transnational, transgenerational criminal syndicate that has taken control of our country, our finances, and has done, is able to do things like this atrocity, he explains how they operate, how they operate in the more general picture. Uh, you know, so that's, that's why I have this book. So these two books I have up here, they, they, are 20, they cost $20 per book. So that's, that's what I have tonight for you. Now, who am I? I'm from, I'm a, I was born in, in Chicago. I grew up in Illinois, suburban Illinois, suburban Chicago. And uh, I, was, uh, I grew up in the church. I was an Eagle Scout. I was an altar boy. And... Uh, I, I grew up during the Vietnam War. I grew up at a time, the Vietnam War was in, in, kicked off when I was in first grade, and the Vietnam War didn't end until I finished my last year of high school. So it, I grew up in that generation, in that time period, where most of the people that I knew were against the war, and we were fighting this war in Southeast Asia that nobody could explain why we were really there. My mother, my father, but there was also a very vibrant anti-war music, you know, the, Woods, the Woodstock generation, all the songs. There was a, a strong movement against the whole war industry. And I, to me, that made sense. And, and what I find most, most disturbing is that now we have been in a war in, in Iraq since 1991. It's like we're, we're fighting a 23-year 20, war already in Iraq, and we're not done yet. And as you know, I've just come back uh, to the United States uh, three weeks ago, but I, I, particularly now I've looked at CNN just to see what President Obama's going to say and this whole thing about they're, they're upscaling the war against Syria now. They're going to start bombing. They're bombing in Syria. They're bombing in Iraq. This is like phase two or phase three or phase four. I don't know who keeps track of, of the whole deception that started with 9-11. 9-11 was September 11, 2001, the bombing of the World Trade Center and the bombing of the Pentagon. And it, that is the seminal event of our time. That is the crime, that is the atrocity that has shaped the America we live in now. It was the event that was meant to kickstart the war on terror and, and to change America. But what it's, most, what it's done most fundamentally, what I see, is that it's changed the relationship of the person to the state, and the state to the person. That, that relationship today between how the, state re how the state reacts to us and how we react to the state is different than I ever thought it would be in this country. Well, what I did is, I'll just tell a brief story about how I got started on 9-11. We were passing through New York City on September 11th in the morning, early in the morning. I was, we were coming from Vermont. I had my wife my two kids in the back seat. We were coming down from Stowe, Vermont. I was trying to get back to Washington, D.C. Um, I, I had worked as a journalist for about one year and three months with a little newspaper in Washington, D.C. called the American Free Press, which I now have learned since I left that is basically a, 
a controlled opposition outfit. It's, 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 I'm sad to say that, but that's what it is. Um, it's, it's like these papers are, are established and they give a lot of good information. And in, by giving a lot of good information, they, they get a lot of people, they, they corral this group of people around them. But what they're basically doing is they're co-opting they're co-opting any real patriotic movement in this country. So, but I was free to write. You know, I, I started writing with them in, in June 2000, and then very quickly in the fall of 2000, they, they reduced my relationship with the paper to being an independent, I was an independent contractor. So that meant that I could, um, you know, write whatever I wanted. That's what, that's what I did. I wrote. And I had, I had lived in Sweden before. I live in Sweden now, but I'd lived in Sweden, and I had seen how terrible things can happen, like a shipwreck called the Estonia sank. A thousand people died, 502 Swedish people, and the, the very modern, very democratic state of Sweden swept the truth under the rug. And I saw that from 1994 until I came back to the States in, in uh, 1996. And, and then I was just back in the States, and I saw T TWA 800 went down in the summer of two, 19, 1996. And uh, I attended the hearings. I was very intrigued by that, because that was a case where there were, there were uh, 125 people who, who were on Long Island that day, and they observed, they observed a missile streaking from the surface of the ocean going up and hitting the plane and exploding. It was 125 people saw that. And I went to the final hearings of the NTSB, the National Tra Transportation Safety Agency. And after the two days, they said, they, at the very end, they dealt with these eyewitness testimony. And you know what they said? They said, well, we have to assume it was a very hot afternoon in Long Island. It was the end of the day. It was a, it was a weekend, I think it was. And they said that we, 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 we figured that these people had all been drinking, and they hallucinated that. <laughs> they, they all hallucinated a missile going up. And when I came out, that was, in the, that was the, the final hearing in the fall of 2000. I went back to the office, and I, I, I realized that this country had a vision. I had seen a cover-up in, in Estonia, in, in, in that country. Then I saw that they were doing the exact same thing in this country with TWA 800, complete lie. And you know that's where they said that there was a spark in the central fuel tank, and that blew it up. And they, they, they created all kinds of fabrications for, to explain what people saw. So this is like the background. And I had, as a, as a journalist, I, I wrote about these things. And uh, I also wrote a great deal about the Middle East, because my specialty is Israel and Palestine. I have a degree in history from the University of California. And I had spent a lot of time in Israel. I've gone to the Intifada. I've seen the Intifada. I've seen all these things that Israel has been doing over the years. I was in Israel starting in 1975. Uh, and I went, spent a lot of time there in the late 70s. And I lived on a kibbutz. I was a lifeguard on a kibbutz there in the Jordan Valley, just by the Sea of Galilee. And I had an Israeli girlfriend, a very smart girl. And um, I was there when, when the Likud party took over, when Menachem Begin took over, when this Likud coalition came into power. Now, the Likud coalition is basically composed of the leaders of the former Zionist terror gangs, the Irgun, the Lehi, Stern Gang. So people like Shamir, Yitzhak Shamir, and Menachem Begin were the founders of this party. And when, when that group, when that Likud coalition came into power, Bosmat was very sad. And all the people on the labor kibbutzes were very sad. They said, this is the end of Israel, they said. They said, the terrorists have taken over. I didn't know what she meant by that, because I didn't quite, you know, I, my, my, my understanding of Zionist history wasn't that, that long as hers and, and her grandparents. But they saw this as a, a, a black day for Israel. Now, that is a very important day, a very important event, because when these people took power, when Menachem Begin and Yitzhak Shamir and their crew took over the power of the Israeli government, when they came to power, these are people who, who use terrorism as a strategic tool. They use terrorism to achieve their ends. This is not to say that other Israelis have not used terrorism, like in 1967 when the Israelis bombed the USS Liberty. That was not a Likud coalition government. Or in 1952, when, or 53, when they had the Lavon Affair, when they bombed American and British buildings in Egypt. That was not a Likud government. 
But that was, those events were done by the Likud guys who then came to power. When they blew up the King David Hotel, for example, Menachem Begin was the one who ran the operation. Zippy Livni's father, Eitan Livni, was the manager of operations. Um, they blew up the hotel because the British had, had, had gone on a raid throughout Palestine, and they had gotten a lot of evidence of Jewish agency involvement in the terrorism and crimes that were going on under the British mandate. And all that material, all that evidence was in this hotel in Jerusalem, which was British headquarters in the mandate period. So what, what <clears throat> Begin's crew, what these, what these terror, Jewish terrorists did, is that they dressed up like Arabs and took big 50 kilo cans of, of explosives and went down in the basement like they were bringing, delivering milk and put these big milk cans around the central core columns of the building, blew it up, and half the building fell down. All the evidence was destroyed, 90 people were killed. It's the worst act of terrorism thus far in Israeli-Palestinian relations. So that was the, that's my understanding. I, I, I knew these kinds of things. I studied the Zionist history. And so when something happens that doesn't make sense, that affects the Middle East, like 9-11, you, you have to put on your thinking cap. And that's what I did. Because when, when we left New York, we couldn't, we couldn't go back to New York City. We're, it was 2 o'clock in the morning. We came through New York City. Um, odd, an odd thing, as we're, as, we're passing, as we're passing Manhattan on the Jersey side, my wife was telling me a dream to keep me awake, in which she dreamed that we had been flying, that we had been um, approaching in a car a city with a huge skyline. And she said she had had this dream just when we left Chicago on this little week trip that we were making. And she said, we were approaching the city with this huge skyline, like only New York has. And in her dream, she saw a, an airplane coming at our car, flying right at us from in front. And that plane went into the ground, she said. And she turned around and saw the plane come out of the ground behind the car and swirl around again. Then there were several planes, and they were attacking our car. It was what you call a vivid dream. She had this very vivid dream. And she saw me at 2 o'clock in the morning. Finally, we found a hotel um, inside the, just inside the Maryland boundary there. And in the morning, I saw the plane had crashed. I called the office. I said, I, I'm not coming to work today. I'm not coming to Washington. The Pentagon there got hit. And uh, uh, so I started taking the, the country roads to, across Pennsylvania to go home. And the first indication that was very important was Ted Koppel came on the news at about 12 o'clock on the radio. And Ted Koppel said that the FBI is looking for five Middle Eastern men who were seen videotaping the attack on the World Trade Center and they had been like celebrating it. And this is a, a, news, a news blurb. And I thought to myself, Middle Eastern, hmm, it could be Israeli. That's part of the Middle East, right? And, and uh, it turned out the next day, when I, uh, two days later when I got home, I contacted the uh, Paulo Lima at the Bergen Record, who is in New Jersey. And he had written about these five men who were captured in New Jersey by the local police and then turned over to the FBI. And they turned out to be Israelis. These are the five dancing Israelis, they're called. Two of them are Mossad agents, and the other three were like working for the Mossad agents. And they were like, they pretended to be moving men. They had a moving van, and they worked for Urban Moving Systems, which was a, which uh, the, the Jewish newspaper, The Forward, revealed to be a, nothing but a Mossad front. It was a Mossad front company. That means it wasn't really a moving company. It was a company that was made to look like a moving company for another reason. And the FBI went to this office right away to find out about this company. And the owner of the company was an, an Israeli man named Dominic Souter. The FBI interviewed him the first time. But before they could interview him the second time, he fled the country. So the FBI probably must have let him flee the country, because if he's a, if he's a suspect in something like 9-11, you keep pretty close tabs on him. You, you're not going to let them just like leave the country because they want to go back to Israel. But these five chaps. Two, two of them were called the Kurtzberg brothers. They were known Mossad operatives in the United States. They're, they're on a list that law enforcement has. So these two boys were known to be Mossad agents. The other three were operatives. They were working for those two guys. And they, these, these chaps were held in, the, you know, they had like box cutters. The, the van tested positive for explosives. They had thousands of dollars stuck in their socks and multiple passports. You know, they fit all the, the usual, um, you know, profile for People are up to no good. But the, um, when they were captured, the New Jersey police, you know, the FBI took over the investigation, took over the van, took over everything, 
And that was the end of it. Well, after that, um, I contacted Paulo Lima, and he, you know, he told me this story and everything that he had found in, the, in the, his research. But what was most peculiar about this is that this story of importance, great importance, was never printed in a New York paper. It's printed right across the Hudson River in the Bergen, in the New Jersey papers, but it wasn't printed in the New York Times. It didn't get in the New York Post or anything. So then I realized that very important, very important stories about 9-11 were being censored. They were being censored. Then when you see that, you, you know something's up. When, when such important stories are, are censored. Another one was, there was a, you've, you've probably heard of the story about the 4,000 Israelis who didn't show up for work that day. Now, this is a very simple story. It's, it's that uh, it comes from the Israeli foreign ministry that 4,000 families contacted the Israeli foreign ministry in Israel asking about the, how were their loved ones who were supposed to be at work in the World Trade Center or the Pentagon. They wanted to know, is he okay? Are, are they okay? And the, uh, the Israeli foreign ministry uh, reported this to the Jerusalem Post, which is the most conservative newspaper in Israel in the English language. And the Jerusalem Post put it on their website on September 12th or 13th, very early on. And, and this was very odd because there were only three. Of the 4,000 that were supposed to be at work that day, only three died. And that's incredible. So you say, well, what happened? Well, then we found out in the New York Times, another one article about a system called Odigo, which was an Israeli instant messaging system whereby um, you, could, you could send a message, for example, in Hebrew and say and choose Buddy Finder. I'll choose send this to all people who speak Hebrew on the, on the network and all people who are Israeli by nationality. So you choose the parameters and it goes to everybody. And they, have a, they can have a blueberry, they can have a page, uh, they can have any kind of pager, any kind of device. All platforms were reached. It was very effective. So those 4,000 people got that message. And it, 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 only came out to the, it only came out to the public because a couple employees of Odigo, O-D-I-G-O, in Israel told the media that they got, they, they said, we got this message too. And so the FBI sent, FBI, U.S. government sent the FBI agents over there to find out more about this message. Who sent it, where it came from, et cetera, et cetera. This was reported in the New York Times. Only once, only once, mind you. And, and there was some, some, a follow-up story later, I think in the New York, in the Washington Post, said that the president of the company of Odigo in Israel, Alex Diamandis, told the media that, and that, that the message, the warning, was precise to the minute. That means that the message said, do not go to the World Trade Center today at 8.45. All hell will break loose. You don't want to be there. And that's what happened. Now, these people that got this message, none of them picked up, maybe they did, but none of them seemed to have picked up the phone and called Mr. Giuliani or the chief of police or the fire department and say, listen, I got this, got this warning here. You better do something. Well, that's what happened. So with those two bits of evidence, those two bits of information that came in the very first week of 9-11, were printed in the newspaper. I'm, you know, I'm not making this stuff up. One was in Jerusalem Post, New York Times, Washington, Washington Post, New York Times, and Jerusalem Post. I said, this looks very much like the Israelis had prior knowledge. They had prior knowledge. At least they had prior knowledge. And prior knowledge of such events, what, a prior knowledge of, of an event like 9-11 means complicity. There's only one way you can say it. It reminded me, for example, of the prior knowledge that the Israelis had that a certain Mercedes truck of a certain color, of a certain kind, was going to drive to the Beirut airport in 1982 and blow up. And they told, they, the Mossad knew about this truck. They knew what it looked like, what color it was, where it was coming from, you know, but they only gave the American military the skimpiest of details. Mm -hmm. They said something like, you know, there's a danger that you might have a truck bomb in the future. But they knew exactly what truck it was. It was coming from the Beka Valley. Now, that's what I'm saying is that, like, so the Israelis had this information. They knew something was going to happen. They knew it was going to happen at 8.45 in the morning, but they didn't tell anybody. So with that understanding, I began my investigation. And I used it as a working hypothesis that the Israeli intelligence, with the, with the, with the help of their dedicated Zionist crew in the United States, had planned this crime, the atrocity of 9-11, carried it out, 
and then, of course, subsequently then covered it up and promoted the deception that we're now living under today. For 13 years, we have been living under this deception. You are a remarkable group of people because you seem to understand that we've been deceived. And, and for every one of you, there should be 100 more at home who are afraid to come. They don't want to hear, hear this Nazi speak or this anti-Semitic conspiracy theorist speak. I tell you, I'm none of the above. I, I lived in Israel. I speak Hebrew. Um, I, I actually married that Israeli girl later on. And, uh, but I, I, I understood, I saw how Israeli intelligence works. And all I can tell to my friends in this country who might have a, a rose-colored view of Israel, who, who, who have the Hollywood view of Israel, and think that it's a wonderful place, a savior for the Jewish people, I would just simply say to them that they don't know the, the belly, they don't know the nature of the beast. They don't know the history. Because if they know Zionist history, they would know that it's, it's, not, it's not the nice rose-colored country that they want to believe it is. But American Jews, are, a lot of them are invested, a lot of American Christians. There's something like 50 million Christian Zionists in this country. And they're in Sweden too, and they're in Norway, and they're, who believe that Israel is necessary by God. This state of Israel is there because it's the, it's the harbinger of the rapture or something like that. It's this, all this funky kind of religion. I call this, all this funky religion, I call this false prophecy and a false messiah. Israel, the state of Israel, the state of Israel is like a false messiah for the Jewish people. And, and they're, they're, they're led to believe that the, 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 strong, the strength of Israel and its strength of its military is the savior of the Jewish people. Au contraire, it's not. It's actually the, the greatest harm and the greatest danger to the Israeli people. It's the cause of a great deal of anti-Semitism, of real anti-Semitism. You see, after, after the Israelis did what they did in Gaza in July, in France, they have very real anti-Semitism because they have a lot of Muslims who are really ticked off with what Israel did in Gaza. So it's just like, you know, this, this sectarian divide is, is, is being increased now in Europe in the same way that it's being done in Iraq. You see? And now, now we're seeing that they're, they're dragging up against 9-11 as the reason why we're going to war now in Syria. They're saying that, that, that it's all being done under the authorization of the Use of Force Act that was signed in the first week after 9-11, which gave President Bush the authority to wage war anywhere in the world against anybody who was involved in terrorism against the United States for this act, for this crime. Now Obama has enlarged that so that wherever he wants to go to war, he uses that same authorization. But the, you know, what's happening now in Syria and this, these beheading videos and whatnot, this is basically just more of the same. It's more of the same. It's more of the same deception. It's, it's basically like wag the dog deception. Give the people, give the people a video that's going to really hurt their, hit them in the gut and then say, well, you know, they're beheading American journalists over there. We've got to do something. So here we go again. Here we go again. Well, in this, in this book, the, I point out the Israeli history of uh, Israeli history of the involvement in 9/11, and you have to understand that this was a, a crime that was decades in the planning. In 1979, I have it in the book here. Isser Harel, the founder, the founding father of the of the of the Mossad, told an American visiting Zionist preacher that in in he, the, the preacher asked, "Will will terrorism ever come? Will Arab terrorism come to the United States?" And Isser Harel, the the granddaddy of the Mossad, said. Yes, Arab money buys more than tents. He said, they will attack your tallest building in New York City because that's some sort of fertility symbol. And they want to attack that. So in 1979, he said this. And this was, this was repeated in several articles in Israel and the United States, BeliefNet, things like that. And so how did, the, how did the, 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 the father of the Mossad know that the Arabs were going to like bomb the biggest buildings in America, something that only happened, what, 21 years later, 22 years later? How's this? Well, he said that. And then, at the same time, this idea, this idea of the war on terrorism started with the Netanyahu Institute. The man who's now the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, and his father, Ben-Zion Netanyahu, born in Warsaw under the name Milikovsky. Ben-Zion Milikovsky changed the name to Netanyahu. They created an institute called the Netanyahu Institute on terrorism. 
And they had a, they had a conference in Jerusalem in 1979 in which they basically said that the, that the democracies of the West have to come into the Middle East and fight against the scourge of terrorism, which is hurting Israel, because this terrorism is really aimed at the whole West. So, so Israel was trying to, Israel was trying to like, say, look, we're Western guys, and you're Western guys, and, and they're bombing us now, but they'll bomb you in the future, so you have to all get, get together and go after these guys. That was called the war on terrorism. In Israel, they, they called the same thing terror neged terror, terror against terror. It was a, it was a philosophy of, of the Israelis in the 70s and 80s. But they wanted the United States and Canada and Britain and France to wage this war against their enemies for them. And they saw that this, this had to be achieved somehow. So they had the Jerusalem conference in which Papa Bush was there, George Bush Papa was there, and other people like that. George Bush even gave a speech there. And um, very little is known about this Jerusalem conference. If you look on the website for the Jerusalem conference, you'll find very little. 1979, um, which is very odd. You'll find very little about the Netanyahu Institute either. It's very, very little out there. But there's a guy in San Francisco, an older Jewish fellow, who, who, who did a thesis about this. And I got the thesis, his th college thesis at San Francisco, San Francisco State University. And, he's, and he, he shows that all of the evidence that the Israelis were presenting was fraudulent. Take the question afterwards. All the, all the, all the evidence, all the evidence, all the rates where they talked about terrorism increasing, 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 it was all fraudulent. And that man's last name is Paul, P-A-U-L-L. -L. So you can find the thesis or my, what I wrote about online. But that's very interesting. So they're, they're trying to promote this, this thesis that we should be, that Western democracies should be fighting Israel's enemies because they're a threat to the West. Well, Netanyahu didn't give up. He pursued, he wrote books, books like called Terrorism, How the West Can Win. That came out in 1986. And, and I sat down and read it in one, in one seating there in Santa Cruz. And I, I said, of course, he never, he never even discusses that the Palestinians might have some legitimate grievance. And there might be some reason why they're, they're using this kind of terrorism back. In fact, I mean, of course, the, the Palestinians learned from the Israelis. You know, Menachem Begin, the father of Israeli terrorism, was once asked, you know, by a, a news outlet, you know, how does it feel to be the father of terrorism in the Middle East? And he said, in the Middle East, in the whole world. See, he sees himself as the father, because in, in Zionist history, if you, read, if you read Zionist history from the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, and 60s, you see that this use of terrorism against the Palestinians and against the Brits was a, they, 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 they really developed this way of, of, of dealing with the, the situation there. And so, for example, they would go into a village and kill all the people and throw explosives and hand grenades into the houses where the people are hiding and blow them all up, like in Deir Yassin they did this, but there are many places. And that, that, that put a fear into all the other Palestinians. They said, when, they, when the Zionists come here, they'll do to us what they did to Deir Yassin. So with this kind of fear, the, the, the Palestinian people, when the Israelis started coming, the Zionists started coming in 1948, they fled. They didn't want to be, they didn't want to be you know, cut in pieces and dropped into the well. Now I want to say one thing about fear that's very important. It applies to us, too. The, the use of fear is a tool of the bad guys. So if you ever find a website or uh, any sort of newspaper that seems to be spreading fear, that's making you afraid, big red flag. That is an agency that's not on your side because we, we, we have nothing to fear but fear itself, really. There's, there's no reason to be afraid of anything. You, don't, you shouldn't be afraid of the NSA. Don't be afraid of the FBI. Don't be, afraid, don't be afraid of Homeland Security. Don't be afraid of any of these things. Don't be afraid of the Israelis. Don't be afraid of the Mossad. They're people just like you and me. They put their pants on in the morning like you and I do. They're just people. The people that did 9-11. I, I have no problem calling up Michael Sheratoff and asking him about his Israeli citizenship. But he didn't like that kind of thing. That's why he, he had this operation against me. I paid a price. Okay, we, we, we went to Europe. It was, it was, I was prosecuted. But, you know, you shouldn't be afraid. And if you see somebody that's some agency or some, some website that's trying to make you afraid, they're doing it for a reason. They either want to sell you gold coins or silver coins or survival kits or something. Or they just want you to be afraid. Because when you're afraid, you won't take action. And I can tell you, there's a lot of people that would be here tonight were it not for fear. Okay? Well, in this book, this, the, the, the most, one of the most important chapters 
I started writing this in 2007 in order to basically vindicate myself, to show the world what, what my thesis was, because it, up until then it had only been on a website, and websites can be here one day and gone the next. And, and uh, I wrote this, started writing it in 2007, and my wife told me that you have, to, you have to cite every single thing you say in that article. Everything I write, you have to show the sources, where it came from, who said it, the date, so that the reader can go and find it for themselves. So that's what I did. And, and, and that's very important because these books are not theory. These books are history. These are history. This is, these are like the history books of 9-11. And, and the, 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 the bigger book is like the, the history chronologically developed. And when you read the, this, when you read from 2001 through 2012, and when you, particularly when you read it toward the end, how they, how they destroyed the evidence, how they covered up the crime, their crime, so that, so that the deception could live. Because, you see, if, if they had investigated the steel, if they had investigated the dust, really, they would have found the nanothermite that Professor Jones found. They would have, you know, even in the FEMA report, they talk about the steel, steel beams that, that, that vaporized. They vaporized because such high temperatures were reached that that, that, that steel <laughs> basically vaporized. It, it got so hot. But that's what nanothermite and thermite do. Thermite itself is basically a cutting incendiary that cuts steel or makes steel melt so that you can join railroad tracks together, for example. It's been used for 100 years in Europe to weld railroad tracks together. But when you, when you, when you have the kind of stuff that Professor Jones found in the dust, he found in the dust like little paint chips like, of a paint like this, about this color. And he found these little tiny chips of paint in there. It was bilayered. One side was red like that. One side was silver. When you take these little chips in the laboratory and heat them to 420 degrees Celsius, they go off with a bang. And they yield more energy, they yield more energy per gram than any known explosive. So when you hear people, when you hear the naysayers about the therm, the, the, this discovery say, oh, Bolin, they say Bolin, Richard Gage, and Professor Jones, they're thermite sniffers. And there's, there's no, you know, thermite is an incendiary, it's not an explosive. They're, they're, they're missing the main point. The main point is this is a nanothermetic material. That means it's made basically on a molecular level where you have almost at the molecular size, one-tenth of a micron in size and smaller. You're, you're, putting, you're, you're creating a compound where these aluminum and iron oxide are next to each other as such tiny, tiny particles that the, the speed of the reaction and the power of the reaction is infinitesimally faster and more powerful than regular thermite. Regular thermite goes off with a bang, but when you do it like this, it goes off with an incredible bang. So when, when this discovery was made about the nanothermite in the dust, that was in 2009, but we had been working on it for about four years prior to that. And when, it, when, I, when we really saw the evidence that that was for sure what we were dealing with, I was talking about it on the radio in 2006. Um, Professor Jones was talking about it and, and working on it. We were both attacked. I was attacked in August of that year. He was attacked September 7th of that year. We were both removed from our sources of income. I was fired as a journalist by the American Free Press. He was, he was suspended from teaching at BYU. And so then he had just, he could, he, they let him continue to do his research, which was very important, but he no longer had an income. And now he's even left Utah. He's gone to Missouri, from what I heard. He's going to start, maybe he's going to teach in Illinois. But you have to ask yourself, why were we attacked? Well, we were the ones who, who, who found the, the clearest evidence of, of thermite. I had written about it in 2002 when I talked to the men who removed the steel from the World Trade Center. When they removed the steel and got down to the seventh basement level, and they got down to the bedrock of Manhattan, they found pools of molten, they called it steel, it was really molten iron, in the molten state. That means they found pools of molten iron that were 1,200 degrees Celsius in the molten state. And Peter Tully told me that. Tully, Tully was one of the four contractors. I said, this is very interesting. You know, he, he just he came out with this. I didn't know about it. He just came out with this to me. So I then called Mark Loiseau from Controlled Demolition Incorporated of Maryland. He was the guy who ran the whole thing, the whole how they were going to remove the rubble and take it to the barges and get rid of it. So I asked him, you know, did, um, Peter Tully told me that they found, you all found molten iron at the bottom of the World Trade Center. And he said, yes, yes, it was molten all right. And he said in the, in the basements of all three towers, one, two, and seven. Seven is the 47-story tower that fell at 520 in the afternoon. 
So in the basements of all these three buildings, they found this, this rubble, I mean, this, this molten steel, molten iron, in the molten state. That's very important. Now, you have to ask yourself, now, wait a minute. There's been a huge mountain, maybe 10 stories high, of steel, and they've been spraying water on it 24-7 for three months, you know, until the fires went out. Those fires, those hot spots were burning until basically until New Year's 2001, until, until Christmas, after Christmas 2001. So for three months, so the people who walked on the pile, their shoes were melting. And there was this thin blue smoke, like car exhaust, rising from the pile. And what happened in, in, in Davis, California, uh, a professor there, an aerosol professor, sent what's called a Davis drum, and it was put on a roof near the World Trade Center. And whenever that smoke went up and passed through that drum, that device called the Davis drum measured the size of the particles and what they were. And what Thomas Cahill, his name is Thomas A. Cahill, from the Delta Group at UC Davis, what he found was that the abundance, the, the, the great majority of the particles in that smoke were, again, at the nano size level. That means smaller than one-tenth of a micron in diameter. Extremely small. Now, I want to, this is very important to understand. When particles are that small in smoke, he told me, I said, what could explain that? He said, they can only be produced by fires hotter than the boiling point of the metal involved. So that means that if it's a particle of iron, it was created in a, in, a, in, a, in a fire that was hotter than the boiling point. So I wrote an article, Why Did Iron Boil in the World Trade, Beneath the World Trade Center? And it's like one of the chapters in this book. It's Why Did Iron Boil? And when, when, when I wrote that article, I was at, I'd gone from Provo, met Jones. It was the spring of 2006. I went to Davis. When, I, when they told me this, I asked these guys at Davis Institute, I said, do you realize what this means? And they were afraid. They didn't want to talk about it. They, they, they had the data, but they didn't want to talk about what it meant because they're federally funded. It's a completely federally funded, you know, institute. And so I could see that. I was talking to this one guy, and I was like, I could see this guy just doesn't want to get it. He doesn't want to even talk about it. And Thomas Cahill also. They, they're not going to go there. They're, they protect the government version about 9-11. The data says what the data says, but they don't want to talk about it. Well, when I wrote that article, I was in Davis, California, and I was on my way back to Provo, um, and I had got uh, some papers about the dust from the United States Geological Survey, and I was ready to go, and I talked to my newspaper, and they cut my travel allowance from $1,000 a month to zero. I, 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 I always had a travel allowance of, like, first it was unlimited, like $1,500, $2,000 a month for hotels, for gas, for driving, for renting a car, all that stuff. I don't, I don't own a car, so I would rent a car. And, and when they did that, that meant that I basically had to go back to Chicago. And I didn't want to go to Chicago. I didn't want to go to my home in Hoffman States because the FBI had, had set up a team around me of people who had befriended me who were basically providing the FBI with information. And these people were also telling me this. It's like they wanted me to know that, that the FBI was watching me. And they, they would tell us, yeah, well, you know, some FBI agents came to my house today and asked, you know, a couple hours we were interview, they were interviewing me. They asked a lot of questions about you. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Another guy, who, a Lebanese guy who I had known for a couple of years, he was just a neighbor there. He came in one day and he said, yeah, yeah, I got, I got a second job now. I work for the FBI. And, 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 so, and it's like, so we, we chose in the fall of 2005 to go back to Europe. We were, like, we were like a ping pong ball going back to Europe, coming back when we thought it was safe, not safe, go back to Europe. Well, in 2006, I saw it really wasn't safe because uh, when they cut my, my travel allowance to zero, I did have to go back to Chicago. I went to a family reunion in Montana, I dally. We went to another reunion in North Dakota. But then we had very little money. The kids wanted to go home. They missed their bicycles. So we went there. I was home, I was home only 10 days, and, and the police attack happened at my house. But I, I knew something was coming, because the very first day I got home, I was on the roof fixing the uh, vent, I mean, the, uh, the, the, the air vent for the, for the utility room. And I was putting a router down from the roof into this vent. You know, I was trying to clear out that vent, and uh, a policeman, a police car drove right in front of my house and stopped. He's looking at me. I'm on the roof, it's morning, doing, fixing the roof, and this police car's looking at me, so I, it's like I say, ah, yeah, now he knows we're back. He knows we're back. And then they, there's a police presence around our house. I was watching, because we have a lot of windows, and they were going around our house, like, all the time, se seven, ten times a day. And then, finally, the day before the, uh, the attack, I saw a car going around my house 
with uh, three men wearing body armor and uh, unidentified car, unidentified men, but they had body armor on and they were, they were armed. I didn't know who they were. So the first day I, I told my wife, I said, this car is going around our house. I don't know, you know, it's really weird. I've never seen anything like this before. And then the next day, this, I came out of the, I, at the end of the day, I come out of my porch on the, on, the, on the stoop there, and this car drives by again, just like in Gran Torino. They got the windows rolled down. They're driving by in front of my house very slowly, looking at me like this. You know, just like in, like in Gran Torino with Clint, Clint Eastwood when he has that gang driving by in front of his house. And I said, and the kids are in the front yard. And I, I just said, say hello to the FBI guys. You know, I told the kids, say hello to the FBI. They look at me, what's dad talking about? Well, those police heard that comment. They even heard that comment. They were, that's how close they were. Oh, I, I called, I, I thought about it for a minute. I told, hell yeah, there's still these cars around the house. I called 9-11 after I went to the store and I said, I, I should call, I should call. This is very unusual. So I called 9-11 and they said, we'll send an officer to your house. I said, well, send him in about 20 minutes because I got to buy some food for dinner and I'll be back in about 20 minutes. Well, about 20 minutes later, I'm in the kitchen. I look out the front window and I see that these very same three men that I was afraid of are marched, have marched up my driveway and my Estonian wife is standing there Stop them. She has, a, she has the gardening shears in her hand. She's been trimming the bushes. My little eight-year-old daughter, eight daughter is standing next to her. I said, son of a gun, what is this? So I, I, I should have stayed in the house. You know, I should have hidden in the crawl space or something. But you, I, just, I, went, I ran right out, went by my wife, and I went with these three men. They were standing about as close as you and I are here. There were three men standing in my driveway, on my property, mind you. And I said, who are you? What agency are you with? Because they had, my wife had been asking for identification, they had given none to her either. I said, what agency are you with? Why are you threatening our neighborhood with, your, with this, this gear and, these, and this car? And the one guy in, right in front of me, Michael Barber, he says, oh, we're threatening your neighborhood, are we? And he reached for a piece and behind his back leg because they had the guns on the back leg and back here. And I said, wait, wait, I have to get my brother. And I, 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 when somebody reaches for a gun, that's the first thing you can do is get out of there. And I said, I get my brother. And I went two, three steps. They tackled, me on the, on my, they tackled me on the lawn. This hand was stuck under my, under my body. I was on top of that. And this hand was in a handcuff. And Michael Barber, the one who, who had reached for a piece, was kneeling on my backside, on my legs here. And, and the other guy, one of the other guys, was kneeling on my temple. So they had my, had, he, had, he was kneeling on, my, on the, my head right here with his full body weight. This, is, this is a, a, makes your eyes bulge. It cuts off brain... You know, it cuts off the uh, flow of, of blood to your brain. It should not ever be used for more than one minute because it can, cause, it can cause brain damage. My wife said my eyes were bulging out of my head. She went in the house to get a camera. She wanted to take a picture of this. And, and as, she came out, as, she came out, as she came out of the house, the third officer, who's called the lethal officer, he, he got in front of her and he's going like this. He says, if you take a picture, we'll arrest you too. And so she said, well, if they arrest her, who's going to take care of the kids? Well, they had that all figured out. There were, this crew had come to come to my house. The man who was running the operation, Michael Barber, was actually an officer of Homeland Security. And he had worked, for example, down in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina with a machine gun. So this is what we have now in this country. We have officers in, in every police station in the country who are basically seconded to Homeland Security. So they've been through Homeland Security training. They are the liaison with Homeland Security in Washington. And if Homeland Security needs something done in that your town, They'll call up Michael Barber, for example, in my case. Mike, we have, a, we have this neo-Nazi skinhead, whatever they wanted to call me. He's a bad guy, and we want, you to, we want you to go and give him some hard time. And I went the next morning to the police department, and I, I, I talked to the chief and the village manager, and I said, my first question was, I wanted to know what is the military background of these men. And I wasn't far off, because the two men that ran the operation, Barber and the other fat fella, had learned their police training in Iraq, of course. They were MPs. And, and they had not gone to any police training in the United States. They were, in my town, Hoffman Estates, you don't have to have a college degree. So if you have military training from Iraq as an MP, fine, we can use you. The other chap who knelt on my head, he was a former Cook County jail guard, which is where he learned such tricks. Well, I was then prosecuted. Uh, I, they, they, wanted to, they wanted to say that I had assaulted them. And when I, when I, got, up off, when I got up off the ground and I was in handcuffs, um, then I said, why are you arresting me? What have I done? I called 9-11, and, and you come here and beat me up and, and are arresting me on my property. I haven't done nothing. Of course, they didn't give any answers. They just treated me very badly, took me off to the police station, and 
you know, abuse after abuse after abuse, kind of like Chicago style, what they do. Like, for example, I was parched like this, like I am now, and I said, um, I need a glass of water. I, they put me in a cell, and I, and I went to, the, you know, push the button on the wall where the water should come out. There was no water. I said, I need some water. And the officers outside the bar said, drink from the toilet. It's like, what? And this, this, it was ongoing, ongoing. From the, from the, and I said, why are these guys so hostile to me? What have I done? I mean, I'm a son of a, a village founder. My mother started the library. We started the Episcopalian church. What, why are they attacking me? You know, when the, car, when the police car drove into the, to the garage, there were 12 officers waiting for the car to let me out, and they all were wearing uh, green rubber gloves. And, oh, thank you very much. Thank you. And I said, thank you very much. And, I, and I, when I got out of the car, I said, oh, no, they're, now they're going to work me over. I said, when they opened the door of the car, I said, I'm a journalist, and whatever you do to me, I will write about. I think it had a sobering effect. But then they, they charged me with assaulting, assaulting them, and resisting arrest, in Illinois, they, you, they want you to cop a plea. You have to plea one or the other to make it more you know, easy going for yourself. This is what everybody has to do. If you, if you say, I'm innocent, that requires a trial. I said, I'm, well, I'm, I'm innocent. But of course, your lawyers don't want to have a trial. They don't want to do it. But I got a four-day trial, completely corrupt. None of my evidence was allowed. My expert witness wasn't allowed. Um, at one point, you know, it was, it was a crazy trial. You, it, 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 one, one, one time the prosecutor says, oh, Mr. Bullen, and so who was behind 9-11? Judge, of course, stop, 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 conference, conference. <laughs> they didn't want to hear about that. But uh, I was, when, when, they came, when the, jury was, the jury was hung and 50-50, but the clerk went back there. I was in, in a situation where the judge was a Zionist, the clerk was a Zionist, and the prosecutor was a Zionist. And one of my uh, supporters had gone to the prosecutor's office and said, why are you, why are you prosecuting Bolin? He's done nothing wrong. And the prosecutor, Blumenfeld, Bloom, Bloom, Bloomberg or something, he said, he said, well, I've looked at Mr. Bolin's writings, and they, I find them to be anti-Jewish, and the prosecution will go on. <coughs> so that's what I was facing. So I wrote the book to, to show, you know, to put it all together. I had all these articles that I'd been writing. I, I knew what 9-11 was about. But then I sat down when I got to Europe. First we went to Norway, then we went to Sweden, finally in Estonia. I started writing. And Estonia is a very good place to write because there's nothing else to do there. It's very cold. I don't speak Estonian. It's a, we lived in the countryside. It's very Spartan. And it was ideal for writing and thinking. I was doing a lot of heavy writing and thinking. I would spend, I would spend my whole days researching and writing following up leads, and I still had access to my good library databases so I could find these articles, and I started putting it together piece by piece by piece, which is what this book, which is what this book is all about. And the, um, uh, my wife told me that you had to cite everything. I did that, and uh, the book was, uh, there was an Estonian publisher who knows my wife, who owns all the media in Estonia. It's a very small country of 1.5 million people. And she knows this man. His name is Hans Luik. He owns all the media in Estonia. He's sponsored by the Rothschilds in Britain. This is how they do it. Like, they, they create a millionaire, a local millionaire, like you. You want to help Mr. Mr. Rothschild? You will be our media millionaire. We'll make you a millionaire. You, you just had a little weekly paper. Now you'll own all the papers. And you'll own the TV stations, too. And this man wanted to, he, he pretended that he wanted to print my book in Estonia, which I thought, OK, he'll do it. Let's see. Because at that time, you still needed to have a publisher. And I said, okay, that's it. And he took, he wanted, he said, he took one chapter of the book, the book, chapter seven, it's called The Architecture of Terrorism, in which I name, which I show the whole flow chart, all these people, who, these Israelis, high-level Israelis, who are involved in the 9-11 setup, the whole thing. And, and he, there's, there's a lot of statements of fact in that chapter. He sent it to an English fact checker in, in Britain who was hostile to my thesis completely. He checked 105 facts and found not a single one to be wrong. All 105 statements of fact were correct. And Hans Luik said, but wow, you know, congratulations, Christopher. You got, a, you got a perfect mark on that. He said, what did you expect? I mean, the information that I put in this, in this, it's not coming from me. It's coming from sources that open sources and sources that are verifiable. And I would not put anything in the book that could not be verified. Like, for example, there's that comment that, that Ariel Sharon said, 
like in 2001, he says, he told Shimon Peres, Shimon, you're always worrying about the Americans. Shimon, let me tell you, you don't have to worry about the Americans. The Jews control America, and they know it. But that was supposedly said on, you know, Kol Israel uh, is, you know, and I don't, I don't have the, I have not verified it. Maybe he did say it, maybe he didn't. But because I couldn't verify it, I didn't put it in the book. You see, I want the book to be history, not any sort of, you know, the facts, the facts of 9-11 are damning enough. There's no reason, you, ha you don't have to add any, any fuel to the fire, no speculation, no conjecture. The facts say enough. So now, with, I've told you about the book and, and, and my history. I would like to open the floor to you, people who have questions. I know you had a question, because this, the questions, you know, um, you have questions and answer your questions. That's very important. It's really one of the most important part, parts of such an event. Who's got a question? Where's the man with the question? There, you, you, wait, you got a question. Well, my question was, because this information is vital, this is so important, that as you were presenting your talk, yeah. how much of your information in your talk is in this book? Okay. So we know um, approximately how much more we need besides okay. this book if, if there's a... a um, well, this book, okay, you know, um, in, the, in this talk, my talk is rambling. I go here and there. You, I'm explaining my background. This book, Solving 9-11, The Deception Changed the World, shows you that, that how we've been deceived, who's behind the deception, and the history of this kind of deception. It's not new. It didn't start yesterday. It's been going on for a long time. And, um, but but I, show, I, I, I show chapter by chapter you know, how, it, how it works. There's, there's one guy in here, Rafi Eitan. Raphael Eitan, there's two Raphael Eitans, but this is one who was a chief of staff in the Israeli military. And he's, he, there's a quote in here where he said that um, the things, you know, he's talking about the Israeli government, he says, the things that we're doing in Colombia, you know, we've done things a thousand times worse than what we're doing in Colombia. But he said, but that's because these were decisions that were made by the Israeli cabinet. He says, it sounds terrible and everything, but he says, if the Israeli government decides that to do something, you know, for a matter of national security, it's okay. If an individual were to do the same thing, it would be illegal. And he, he made this comment in the Jerusalem Post, and he was then found dead. Uh, a little bit later, he, he was on the pier in, in Tel Aviv, and they found his body in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, you have to understand this about Israel, is that Israel is a very, today, I, I call it a form of social Darwinism, where the most ruthless and aggressive powers have come to the top. Yitzhak Shamir is a good example. Yitzhak Shamir was a little thug from Brest-Litovsk, from uh, Poland-Ukraine border area there. Tough guy, a little tough guy. And you know, he, when he became the Prime Minister of Israel, there was no hiding his toughness. He has a very guttural <laughs> accent. He's a, very, he's a tough little guy. And he was the Prime Minister like when they were in Lebanon, bombing all those places and things back in Lebanon time, 82. Well, um, he, he, would, he would go to the beach, for example, with somebody like, like uh, Rafi Eitan, Rafael Eitan, and only one guy would come back from the beach. You know? The other guy would be, be, be dead. I mean, this is, this is well known in Israel. And then there's, there's, there's tons of stories. I don't want to labor you with any of these, these kinds of stories, but that's how it is. You see, so Israelis will, will say to themselves, they say very common, they said back in the 70s, we wanted Athens, but we got Sparta. And that's what it is. It's a country that is like survives on war. It, it has war all the time because they, 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 another saying they say in Israel is that they say if we don't have outside enemies, we don't have war, then we fight among ourselves. Okay, so, so that's it. The, in the thesis and in the original articles, you'll find in those two books, it's a set. They both have the same Library of Congress number. So that, you know, it's like these are all the articles in this book. These are all the articles that support the thesis. This is 12 years of, of writing every week. There's 130 articles, lots of information, a lot of detail. OK, your question, sir. Yeah, I've read many articles uh, talking about the fact that Americans believe, half Americans believe that 9-11 was uh, far different than the official story as uh, in the, the mission report. And my question to you is, that given that, there seems to be uh, talk of a, of a new need for a new boogeyman such as the ISIS and so forth, and the next false flag to get step ahead of, a, of the American public catching on. What's your take on that? Yeah, well, we're seeing it all the time. 
false flag is the new norm. False flag terrorism is the new norm. This ISIS group, for example, is, uh, is another creation of US, Israeli, Saudi uh, meddling. We, we created these people. We created, they were being trained in Jordan. For example, the Americans were training these guys in Jordan, these Sunni fighters, not to take any prisoners. They were training them that if you get prisoners, you execute them. Americans were training you know, Sunni fighters to kill prisoners. This is a violation of any norm of war. You don't just kill prisoners. And, and, and it's like when John McCain, John McCain went to uh, Syria in May 2013. And there's a photograph of him sitting there talking to a man in a black shirt, a young man in a black shirt. And this is a photograph, and they're all sitting around, you know. And, and Terry Massan, who lives in Damascus, who's a very knowledgeable researcher of these things, a Frenchman, um, he, he said that this man who is speaking to uh, Mr. McCain, Senator McCain, is Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who is the caliph of Islamic State, who is the caliph. He's the guy that wears all the black turbans and wristwatch and, and gets in the in mosque in Mosul and has, says, we are now the Islamic State. All Muslims should come here and fight the infidels and all that stuff. That's Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. And there's a $10 million warrant for his arrest in the, in the state, U.S. State Department. Now, John McCain's talking to the guy in May 2013. He, in, in April 2013, he created Islamic State. So I wrote to, I contacted John McCain's office about two weeks ago, and I said, you know, I, I talked to the little girl there in Washington, and I said, you know, that uh, Terry Massan, who's a knowledgeable scholar in the Middle East, and he's in Damascus, says that this man in the black shirt sitting right, left foreground, speaking to um, John McCain, is Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Can you tell me your understanding from John McCain, who is the, what is this man's real name? Who is this man? They wrote back, they wrote back and said, um, he is a fighter. He's a fighter with al-Nusra. I said, you have to understand, that's not adequate. You, you're telling me that John McCain goes over, sits down in, in, in the middle of Syria, sits down with a bunch of militia guys and doesn't even know who they are? And he's talking to these people? I said, come on, let's, they, they, they would not give me his name, which indicates to me that Terry Massan is correct. You know, he has the same look. He's, he's seen in the pictures. He's the guy in the background. He's the guy in the background. He's not looking at the camera because he's, he, he'd been held by, in American prisons for a long time and probably trained there. So the, a lot of these characters that are, that are fighting against us and beheading journalists, whether they're beheading them or not, are people that we've cultivated. They're, they're Chechen fighters. They're Al-Qaeda fighters who were paid for. When you see these guys driving it like Lawrence of Arabia, they're driving these Toyota pickup trucks, these cream pickup trucks, there's a row of like 50 of them, those were given to them by the United States government. Yeah. So it's like, this is all another Schauspiel. It's, a, it's, a, it's like a, a big, they've created this film for us to watch. It's Wag the Dog. It's more of the same. But you know, they can't, I think they're, they're very reluctant to do another big thing like 9-11, because 9-11 was decades in the planning. Which isn't to say that they have other plans, B, C, and E, that aren't also decades in the planning they could pull out of the hat. But um, I don't think that they, I, I, you know, we'll see, we'll, we'll see if they do such a thing. But now they're operating the beheading of those journalists. Look what that's done. That, that took America into the war like that. Piece of cake. Question. I, just regarding that, I mean, it, it feels like Israel is forcing America into their mold. Like when they mm -hmm. launched into Gaza, they started out by what? The three yep. Israeli teenagers killed. Yep. And now it's like the three journalists killed. Yep. And now that's all we need. That's yep. all we need to like start. And then also the technique, attack civilian infrastructure. Yep. And, 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 you saw, no prisoners. and you saw two days ago that the Israeli military killed those two men who were suspected of being the kidnappers, yeah. right? But Just kill them. Just kill them. Didn't arrest them because that whole thing. Because they didn't do it. Yeah, the whole thing's a fraud. You know, when, when, they, when they were having this, like, speech, Israel speech, where Netanyahu was speaking, they had these gurneys or these stretchers with Israeli flag on top. It didn't look like there were any bodies under there. So it's like the whole thing is just like one poorly acted play. And, but the play, we're the ones who are being deceived. We are the primary targets of deception. You know, the, 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 the people in Afghanistan have no idea why Americans are in Afghanistan. They, didn't, they don't know that we're there because of 9-11, because they're not, part of the, they're not part of the deception. We're the ones who have to be deceived, because we're the ones who have to pay for this and send our troops and give a political OK to it. Please, your question, sir. If 9-11 uh, was a Zionist job, 
Yeah. How did they um, pre-plant explosives in those three buildings? How did they um, uh, defeat uh, air defense for those hours for the whole yeah, yeah. North America, you know, et cetera? Yeah, how, yeah. how did they do that? That's a very good question. There's, that's, that's, there's two, two questions there, I got to tell you. And they're two very big questions. The first question is, how did they get the explosives in the building? Well, Larry Silverstein, some people say Larry Silverstein, he was the former strip club owner uh, and indicted drug smuggler who had a, a strip club called Runway 69 by LaGuardia, I think it was. Um, and he was, he was indicted, he was indicted in, a, in a drug smuggling scheme, which involved Bill Clinton, actually. The court threw it out, of course. Um, that was a, uh, a, a case. But the thing is, is that he, uh, he, obtained, he obtained control of the buildings in July 26th, on July 26th, 2001 basically five weeks before the events happened, five or six weeks before it happened. He, he, got, he was interested in the property. There was a bidding going on with, between Vornado Realty and, and, and Silverstein. Silverstein borrowed $100 million from GMAC, who went bankrupt later. His friends at GMAC, a couple of Zionist guys took over GMAC. They said, yeah, we'll give you $100 million for this. Yeah, lend him $100 million. So on borrowed money, he put down the down payment on the buildings, and he then got the lease, the 99-year lease, and he got full control of the building. And put a big insurance policy on it. And put a big insurance, two, yeah, big insurance policy on the building, right? So with borrowed money, he then won two settlements, about something like $5 billion. He, he reached, you know, that's a big payback. That's how, that's how so he, had ac he controlled access to the building. Now, the company that, that ran security in the World Trade Center, people will talk about Stratasec. The main company that, that ran security for the building was Kroll Associates, which was a, a sister company, Jules Kroll and Maurice Greenberg. The first plane went into Maurice Greenberg's controlled um, computer room, his, his secure computer room in Marshall McLennan. The CEO of Marshall McLennan was Maurice Greenberg's son. Maurice Greenberg is the man from AIG, if you remember the bailout in 2008, 2009, who received $180 billion in taxpayer funds because he had insured the profits of the banks, of Bank of America and Goldman Sachs. So as soon as, as, soon as um, Maurice Greenberg's company, um, AIG, as soon as they got this $180 billion, it went straight to Goldman Sachs and to the Bank of America. But it, 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 wouldn't look good. it wouldn't look good for American taxpayer dollars to go directly to Goldman Sachs, so it went through AIG, because AIG had insured those dodgy derivative deals that Goldman Sachs made money on. And of course, those guys all got huge bonuses. You know, American taxpayers are bailing out these dodgy criminal companies. Maurice Greenberg is, ha, runs a criminal operation. He once joked. They asked him, they asked him like, he, he, somebody said, like, uh, um, how long would it take for us to be, to do, be legal? And he said, if, if we were legal, we wouldn't be in business, something like that. He said, so that, that, that guy owned the building, owned the, the, the company where the first plane went. The second plane went into a, a secure computer room owned by Fuji Bank. Now, it's very important. Both planes went into, into computer data centers where there were no people. There were just banks and banks and banks of computers. And in the second room, the, the second building, the, the building 175, 175 went in the South Tower, that was Fuji Bank's room, reinforced floor. But a, a man who worked in that room told me that there had, in the summer prior to 9-11, they, they had put rows and rows and rows of these big, bulky, heavy batteries, backup batteries. But he said the strange thing is they were never turned on. So what, what I, I think was in those batteries was something called thermate, thermate, which is a form of thermite, and that when it goes off, it creates this bright orange flame and a lot of white smoke. The white smoke is the aluminum oxide, the orange flame is created by barium added to the mix. And it's used in Hollywood. It, it gives this big explosion. You see it. And if you look at both buildings when they're hit by a plane, you see huge, big clouds of white smoke being ejected from the side of the building. That's not kerosene. When kerosene burns, it burns a very dark orange, like this. Kerosene, and it creates a, it creates a black soot around it, not white smoke. And if you look at the pictures, if you, if you, next time you look at those pictures, look at the building six, building one, and building two. At the moment of getting hit by the plane, you see tremendous Hollywood spectacles being, you know, created using thermite. And then building building two is very important because before the building collapsed, building two is still standing, 
But before it collapsed, about 10 minutes before it collapsed, a floor, I think floor 81, broke a little bit. And so it, became, it, it, it got out of kilter. It, it got like that. And then all of this molten iron that had been sitting on that floor started to run off a window and started cascading down from the 81st floor. It's like Victoria Falls. This white, bright like the color of these lights, white hot light. It's pouring down from the side of the building. The FEMA report says, we don't know what this is. We don't know how it, where it comes from. But they, 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 they monitor in the FEMA report from the buildings, they monitor every single burst. They say there's a burst of white smoke. Then there was some more molten iron came out. They call it aluminum. There was a, but, but the problem is with their analysis is aluminum is that aluminum in such conditions looks like aluminum foil. It, it's silverish. It's not the color of that stuff. That was iron. Now, this is the, the terrible, terrible thing to, to, to remember about that. That's at the impact floor on building two. It's like floor 81, 82. You have a pool of molten iron, 1,200 degrees Celsius. What is it like for the people on floors 83, 84, 85, 86, 87? They're literally being cooked alive. Because that 1,200 degree heat is going up through the elevator shafts, which are empty, and just comes up the shaft and fills every room, which is why you have those, for example, that telephone call, that woman calling 911, she said, it's very hot in here. It's very, very hot. We're all going to die. The 9-11 lady says, no, don't worry, ma'am. Help's on the way. Don't worry. She said, it's very hot. We, you know, that's because, you know, 1,200 degree temperature is cooking those people. So those people went, in, instead of being cooked, they went and broke the windows and were leaning out of the side of the building. There's a, there's a, there's a one good collection of photographs called This is New York. I saw these pictures. These are t pictures taken by all kinds of people. And these people are hanging off the building. Like, they're, they're hanging from the 100th floor, the 90th floor, you know, looking down in, in the streets of Manhattan. And they said, do I jump or do I stay in that oven there? And they jumped. At least 250 people jumped. At least. Another question? Please. You know, I, I'm uh, sort of in the middle of reading uh, Dr. Judy Wood's book, uh, right. The Word of the Twin Towers Go. Could you talk a little bit about uh, how you feel about her hypothesis mm -hmm. and the, the directed energy weapons? Yeah, very uh, good. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I'm not a scientist. I'm a journalist. And, but um, when, a scientist, when a scientist thinks they have compelling evidence of a new discovery, of a new theory, when they've discovered something, the way they present it to the scientific community is they write a paper, which, which they write with competent professors, competent scientists, and then that paper is put under peer review and then published in a journal. So with Judy Wood and Jim Fetzer, who talks about nuclear bombs in the building, I say Mr. Fetzer is a scientist and Judy Wood is, comes from a scientific background. They certainly know this is what you do. You don't just chatter from the sides, chatter from the sides. What I consider both Judy Wood and Jim Fetzer to be is nothing more than red herrings. Because they came out in 2005, and in the year that this discovery was made, and their role is to present competing theories so that the audience, pe people like you, will say, well, God, you know, there's, there's the nanothermite article, there's the nanothermite discovery, there's the nuclear bombs that did it, and there's Judy Wood's, you know, Buck Rogers beam weapon. Which one do I believe? And that confusion is what they really like. So that you don't know which to choose. You know, so like, they say in German, this is scheißegal. You know, it's, it's the shit equal. This one, which one, which one's proof? Well, I can tell you the difference is they're not, they're not scheißegal because the, the, the um, not nanothermite discovery has been proven and has been printed up in a peer-reviewed journal. It's been, it's been tested. They have evidence of the stuff. What Professor Jones did is he got, he got six samples of peop dust people had collected. They found these chips of paint in there in the dust. And when this ch these little chips of paint were heated up, it went off with a bang. The only problem is that people don't really understand how nanotechnology works. So what I've done on my website, I've put up several articles, several sources, like the DOD has written articles, I mean, big booklets about it, booklets 20, 30 pages long. And you can read about this stuff. And what they talk about is that these nanocomposites of nanothermite can be, can be tweaked so that the energy yield is, goes off the charts. It just goes off the charts, which is what we saw on 9-11. What we saw is, is that the floors were being pulverized. Each, each floor was one acre of four inches of concrete held in a steel pan. If, 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 if it was a collapse, as the government says, you would expect to find 110 floors pancaked at the bottom, like a giant stack of pancakes. That doesn't exist. Because what happened is that this, this incredible heat 
and this, this thermetic reaction went off, then it was aided, it was obviously aided by explosives planted in the core column area, which then blew stuff sideways. So you had a pulverization going on, and, and beams were being thrown sideways huge, at huge force, huge velocity. And yeah, and so that the guys that picked up the rubble, they said all that was left was steel and dust. And the dust, the, the signature characteristic of the dust of the World Trade Center is that it contains billions and billions and billions of tiny, tiny little balls of molten iron. They're called iron-rich spheroids. And, and that, is, that is the byproduct that is exactly what you'd expect to find from a thermetic reaction. And like people that, were, that were, people that were hit by the dust, like William Rodriguez, they said it was so hot it burned their legs. Because inside that dust was all this molten iron that, had just, that was just, had just become hard, if it was hard yet. So it was very, very hot. And that, that's proof of, uh, so but, but Judy Wood's theory is very interesting because I went to Berlin at Thanksgiving 2001, because I, I said, I realized by October, I realized very soon that this was a, the government was selling us a big pack of lies, and the media was promoting that lie to the American people. And there would be no questions allowed. Basically, they, they, were, they, had, a, they had Ehud Barak got on BBC TV. He's the former Israeli chief of staff. He's the former Israeli defense minister. He's the former Israeli prime minister. And as soon as the two towers were hit by the planes, before either tower collapsed, he's sitting in the London studio of the BBC explaining to the world in English, his English, what, what and who was behind it. And he said, well, this is very clearly a case of, you know, Osama bin Laden. And we know where Osama bin Laden is. And this is a time for the United States to begin a concrete war on terror. He said, now is the time for the United States to begin a concrete war on terror. You see, so this was, this was, the, this was the event that the Israelis had to do in the New Pearl Harbor in order, to, in order to shock in all the American people so that you could implant in their head this, you know, Ehud Barak's th understanding. And oddly, that, was, that became the working plan. That became the plan. That became, nothing changed. We went to war then, three weeks later, in Afghanistan, looking for this guy, and we've been there ever since. And we are a nation deceived. We are a deceived nation. And, and when you are deceived, when you're deceived at that level, you're enslaved. So to anybody in this country, for example, who believes the official version, like Mr. Tillman, the football player, he, he had a contract to play football with the St. Louis Cardinals, but he believed that Osama bin Laden did this to our country, and he said, well, you know, screw the football contract. I'm putting on the uniform. I'm going over there and clean house on these guys. And he was shot. You know, he, he's just one of the guys from San Jose. He was shot by friendly fire because he saw and was writing back to his mom in San Jose, this war isn't about, what, about Osama bin Laden. He said... We're protecting, the, we're protecting the opium fields here. And he was writing this kind of stuff, and they said, well, we have to you know, kill the messenger. Okay, so you have the Israelis were involved, and also I'm, I'm, I'm sure you believe the neocons were involved in this, yeah. right? How about, and well, Tillman and others, right, they were deceived, but you have generals in the, in the army yep. and so on. They're yep. very intelligent, and they could figure it out. Yep. Now, of course, they, did they feel it was a deception, or were they part of the deception? Well, the thing is, is that you have to understand that the U.S. military, of course, like all militaries, is a completely hierarchical establishment. The guy at the top says, snow is black. Everybody down here says, snow is black, sir. Right? That's how the military works. You learn that in basic training. So, the, and the U.S. government is the same. State Department says this. You say, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. It's all like that. The whole U.S. government is like that. That's why they have to control the executive branch. When you control the guy in the White House, you control the whole executive branch of the government, which is now basically like 80% of the government, right? And the, what I noticed, what I noticed, I worked with the Palestinian cause a little bit. I'd go to Washington, because that was my, my field of study, and I'd go there and try to help the Palestinians find out why they couldn't get their act together and everything. And what I found is, it, with the US military, is that they were enamored with the Israelis. They thought the Israelis, they thought the Israelis were the smartest, most intelligent, best military in the world. And that's what they believe. And because when you get, when you part, start putting Americans into Iraq or into Lebanon, you're dealing with a country, you don't understand the culture, you don't understand the language, you don't understand anything. So you need somebody in between to interpret what's going on in Iraq. That's where the Israelis come in. 
like in Afghanistan, when the United States was in Afghanistan helping Al-Qaeda and fighting the Russians, the Israelis were managing the whole thing. They're the ones who have people that speak the languages and, and, and would interpret for the Americans. Oh, like now they're talking about, we're going to vet. We're going to vet the, this, this, the guys in Syria. So we're, we're give, we'll give guns to the good guys and not to the bad guys, right? How do you vet Syrian soldiers when you don't even speak the language? You don't understand anything about the culture. You, you have no idea who's who. I mean, Arabs have like 10 different names. How do you know who, who this guy is? Well, because the Israelis will do the vetting for you. You see? Like these beheading videos, as horrible as they are, and this whole thing, how did, this, how did these videos actually come to us? They came to us from the Site Intelligence Group, which is an Israeli-run operation that keeps eye on terrorist groups. It's run by a lady named Rita, Rita Katz, an Iraqi Jew whose father was an Israeli agent and was hanged in, in Baghdad in the 60s. And she came, her family came to Israel. She studied at Tel Aviv University. And she controls, she has this little website. It's basically an Israeli intelligence website. So they, she admitted the other day on CNN about one of these videos. She said, yes, you know, um, we, we actually showed the video before the bad guys because we had, we had it beforehand, she said. She said, we had it beforehand. And they, they only showed it after Sight had showed it. So you see, this is all wag the dog. The Israelis are the ones who are pulling America around like a bull with a ring in his nose. Come on, this way, guy. OK, stop here now. OK, now stop here. And that's what we are. We're, we're, we've been reduced to like mercenaries. We're like the Janissaries for the state of Israel. They want to build greater Israel. They want to control the Middle East. The Americans are the ones who are doing it for them. Yes, sir. Uh, some of the biggest uh, blockheads in America today are the American so-called skeptics, uh, partially led by the likes of uh, Michael Schur and others of that sort. Uh, what's your opinion about the failure of skepticism in this country to fa utterly fail in the analysis and the, and the in getting at the truth of 9-11? Well, are you talking about a, a, a specific group or, or in general, Americans? In general, yes. In well, general. I can tell you that every single institution in this country has betrayed us about 9-11. Our churches have betrayed us. Our schools have betrayed us. Our political leaders have betrayed us. Our law enforcement has betrayed us. Everybody's betrayed us. All it shows me is how utterly rotten our system has become. Because we have had it very good for a long time since World War II. I grew up, I finished high school in 1975, which was the peak year, actually. Things were going very well in the United States. And people felt that, well, we're so rich, we're so powerful, we're number one in everything. We must be, we, it must be God has ordained us to be so great. We, we, got, we got fat and lazy, and we, we didn't pay attention that the mice were taking over here and there and everywhere. And I, we have a, a defense policy board that creates policy for the Pentagon from a, a bunch of Zionist Jews who have inserted themselves between the Pentagon and the government so that, that people like Wolfowitz and Richard Pearl craft the, craft the policy and the Kagan family. The, you know, the Kagan family, the Donald Kagan, you might say Kagan, I don't know. Donald Kagan, Robert Kagan, Frederick Kagan. Donald Kagan is the father from Lithuania. He's a little bit cross-eyed. And his two sons, Robert and Frederick, they, they created a group called the Project for a New American Century. They came out with a document in 2000 that said, it said this. It's called Rebuilding America's Defenses. It said the United States will have to take, occupy Iraq and build bases in Iraq whether Saddam Hussein is there or not. So Saddam Hussein wasn't the issue. The issue was that the United States will go into Iraq, occupy it, and put, a, put bases there, like we have in Germany, for example, which is exactly what we did. We built huge bases and huge embassies, like we're there to last forever, right? And now the Israeli plan for the Middle East is, cut, is to cut the big countries into little pieces ethnically, so that like, they'll, they'll do to Iraq what they did to Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia used to be a big country with seven districts. Now it's seven countries. And they're all very poor and very weak, which is, which is what they want to do. It's called balkanization. That's what they want to do in Iraq. Now, now, when you talk about skeptics, the media, everybody has betrayed us. So I wrote a letter to the pope, the new pope, the Argentinian guy. I, I, I sent him some basic material from architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth that anybody can see that the government version is false. I didn't send him my book or anything. I said, I said pope, you have to understand that, that we have been deceived. And it would, do, it would be very important for you just to tell the people 
listen, people, we have been deceived about what happened on 9-11. That's all you have to say. But the Pope won't even do it. You know, they're more concerned about homosexuals here, or homosexuals there, or whatever. They're concerned about all kinds of pseudo-issues, while the burning issue, the elephant in the room, is like, oh, I don't see it, I don't see it. I hope I answered your question. Next question, please. All right, I, I don't mean to digress much, but you are a whistleblower of sorts. How do you balance what the sacrifices this has cost you and your family to, to do this? And I, I perceive it as a very noble thing, what, what you have done, but the problem is people like to believe what's in their comfort zone. Right. And so we have little people coming out, uh, Snowden, right. Assange, and not, very little changes because we don't want to become uncomfortable here. That's true. So I'm not, you know, people do what's right because it's, it's right, but right. How, how do you protect yourself? Well, um, I'm on tour here from Sweden. Um, I really only would have a judicial problem if I went back to Illinois. If you remember that song from the 60s, Indiana wants me, Lord, Lord I can't go back there. Well, I'm, I'm the next state to the west. Illinois wants me. And, and the, the mayor of Chicago, the mayor of Chicago is Rahm Emanuel. And Rahm Emanuel, I, 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 I spoke to his father. His father is Benjamin Emanuel. He's an Israeli guy born. Well, the thing about Benjamin, I spoke to Benjamin Emanuel, the father of Rahm Emanuel, and I said, Mr. Emanuel, I understand you were, um, a Zionist fighter in the 30s and 40s. Can you tell me which organization were you with? Were you with Irgun? Were you with Begin? He said, no, I was Lehi. He was Stern Gang. He was under Shamir. And, 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 and the late Sherman Skolnick in Chicago, who was in a wheelchair, who was a great Jewish uh, truth digger into the Cook County court system, he said that Benjamin Emanuel was, not only was in Lehi, and we know that, but that he was involved in the murder of Folke Bernadotte who was the United Nations envoy who, went, who was sent there in the 48 to kind of like make this partition plan work somehow so it wouldn't be war. And there was a Bonnie, they did a Bonnie and Clyde. They, they stopped his car outside Kalandi Airport. These Israeli guys, you know, went to the car with the Sten guns and <laughs> killed him in the back seat. Colonel Serro, the Frenchman, and Volker Bernadotte, who is the uncle of the current king of Sweden and who was married to the woman Estelle. And it's interesting that Victoria, the crown princess of Sweden, her new baby is named Estelle, after the American mother. But you say, well, what, what about my price that I pay? First of all, when I started writing this, it just, it's just the destiny of God, that, that I happened to be in New York on that day, that this fell right into my lap, that, that I have a specialty in these kinds of government cover-ups. I've seen them. I know how they happen. I'm, I know how the Israelis operate. I have all this history in my head. So it's like I said, well, this is, this is, I'll write about it. I'll dig. I'll look. And, and people would say, you're very brave, you're very brave. I didn't see it bravery. I, I, my logic was that 99% of the American people, really 99.9% .9 of the American people, are on the side of truth, right? Yeah. We want to know what happened. The only guys who don't want the truth are those who are the culprits or who are associated with the culprits. And I said, well, that's, that's, that's got to be less than like one-tenth of one percent. So what's there to worry about? I'll tell you what's to worry about. That one-tenth of one percent are rich, powerful, and organized. And the 99% are neither. Some have some money. So, but they're, we're not organized. And there's, a, there's I got to say this one thing. Kurt Vonnegut, who uh, is a, from Indiana and a famous author, he wrote Slaughterhouse Five. I lived in Slaughterhouse Five for a little while, but that's another story in Dresden. But um, Kurt Vonnegut wrote a book called Sirens of Titan, in which he says this very interesting quote. He said, There's no reason why good should not prevail as often as evil. He said, The triumph of anything is a matter of organization. And he said, if there is such a thing as angels, I hope they get organized along the lines of the mafia. You see, and there are angels. There are certainly angels. I believe in angels, but we are angels. We are good people who believe in the truth, who believe in our country, who want the best for our, for our children, for our families, for our neighbors. And it, it's our duty to organize things like this, to organize ourselves, to fight for the truth, to show these, these bastards who've done this to our country that we're not going to take it. That we're just not going to take it. I mean, we have to show some backbone. And Americans are not used to the, the whole idea. It scares people. Wait, you're telling me that the media is lying about all this stuff? Well, now, when I look at the media here in this country, I turn it on. It's scary. They, in the hotel, they have this good morning show. It's just, it's just fluff. It's just inane fluff from beginning to end. It's like, what has happened to the minds of people? You know? 
It's mush. And, and, and it's like, and CNN is just like the constant barrage. It's like in New York, you know, the, in, in New York, the media bombs you with bombardment, with messages all the time. It's no, no t- American TV is the same now, everywhere. It's, it's mindless, it's clueless, it's not truthful, and it's just meant, to, just meant to confuse you. It's just meant to confuse you. So we have to, yeah, you have to, you have to turn off the TV, you have to read, and you have to read, you have, you have, to, you have to train your mind in critical thinking, and have moral courage, and I, I, what I do, it can be very depressing. You know, I live in Sweden in a little apartment. It's like DDR, you know, and, and, and sometimes I don't make enough money to pay the rent. Then I have to go to the social office, and they, and they say, well, you're, you're 2,000 crowns under the norm. We'll take care of that. And they put 2,000 crowns in your account so you can pay your, so you can pay your rent. It works very well. And I try, and they, 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 they actually... They, you know, when I came out of these books, I, I, I got in a program for the, you know, work guys. And it's called Start to Egg It, Start Your Own. And I said, yeah, I, I got this great book, and I'm going to sell these books, and, and, and we'll be able, we'll, we'll reach that norm, no problem. We'll make that norm. And they, they put me through a course, and I gave it to the, the, the teacher, said, this book is great, you know. And so, but Sweden is a very fair country, and they've let me do this, you know. So um, I, I can only say that that's a, that's a good thing. And, but, but, you know, look at my life. Okay, you're only on this planet for a short time, right? I'm 57 years old, born in 57. I don't know if my dad, if I live to be, you never know when your last day is. So you have to do what's right while you're here. You, while you're, <laughs> it's like that. A question back there? To your knowledge, um, how do you see the uh, possible overlapment of what we call surveillance state, uh, NSA, DHS, and Israel? Oh, God, that's a good question. It's a little bit out of the subject, but it's, it's very true. These Israelis have for years been inserting themselves again as the men in between, the people in between, which is a, which is a, a, a very important aspect of this book, how this transnational, transgenerational criminal syndicate works. And they insert the people in between. So that like at the NSA, the two companies that were in the middle, who were diverting the, you know, the prism, who were diverting the data here and there through the prism, was an Israeli company. Both companies were Israeli, actually. And, and as we now know, the data has been going to Israel all along, unredacted. Not just the metadata, everything's gone there. So the Israelis have all of this NSA information. What do they do with it? They use it for, for blackmail. Like they, that General, General Petraeus wasn't quite doing what they wanted to do. They say, hey, what about that girl from North Dakota that you're screwing, huh? I think your wife should know about that. <laughs> so they, they put a dossier together from the emails, because he and that little girl from North Dakota, the biographer, were, were basically using the same mailbox. They thought they were outsmarting the whole thing. <laughs> we're writing in the same mailbox. They'll never know. Israelis are reading all of it. They put it together in a dossier, and they gave it to a few key guys in Congress. They say, take this, take this ball and run with it. Petraeus was gone the next day. And this is, this is an old history. The Israelis, the, the, the whole spy operation, remember the Israeli art students? They were, they were inserting themselves into DEA, Drug Enforcement Agency, because they wanted to know, what does the DEA know about us? And, and, and the, this, is, this is how it's done. These people in high places are all blackmailable. Yeah. I have one more question. Okay. okay. To your knowledge, what is the um, relationship between the Vatican and the, um, is Israel? No, I don't. I don't know what the relationship is. You know, I know that there's, there's been some... I don't know. You know, the, the Israelis uh, don't give the Catholics a great deal. I mean, they're, they're, they're build their, they build, I don't really know. I mean, there's, yeah, I don't, I, I can't say, I can't say. Yes, please. Yes, I was watching uh, YouTube and I saw Hillary Clinton with uh, Dick Cheney on some kind of a TV show. We don't watch television. So. Right. And they were laughing and joking. And they said they always go to the CFR mm-hmm. to get all their information. Yeah. What is the connection with uh, the Council on Foreign Relations and the uh, White House? Well, the CFR is one of these consensus-building organizations, like the Bilderbergs, like all these people. Like the, I, I, I can speak about Bilderberg more, because I, I, was, I used to be a paparazzi for the Bilderbergs, paparazzo. And that's where I saw George Soros and Carl Bildt. I have this great picture of George Soros and Carl Bildt in, in, in Brussels um, on a break. And George Soros is looking at me like this. And then, and, then, and then after that picture, the thugs came after me, and that was the end of that, that, was the end of that operation. I had, I had run for my life. 
But the thing is, is that, is that these organizations like CFR and, and all of these think tank type operations, and Bilderberg, Bilderberg is when all these rich men and politicians from the whole Europe and America, basically the NATO countries, go to a secret meeting in the beginning of June every year at some resort in Europe. And Rockefeller, David Rockefeller, is the American head along with uh, Henry Kissinger and, and these people. They basically present their ideas for the coming year. And they, they have politicians there and, and leaders of industry, and they give them the consensus idea. This is what we're going to do, right? This is, this is. Don't you think they chose, though, because um, didn't they interview before we even had Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton, uh, or Bill Clinton, Hillary, yeah. uh, Obama, yeah. before they ran for office, they in interviewed them in front of the council. Yeah, of course. So they must pick the presidents, and they say, you can have Coke or Pepsi. But it's, okay, but it's like, it's, it's, yeah, they're, they're part of the consensus. But I can tell you about Obama, because I'm from Chicago. Obama was a non-entity in Chicago. He was a complete non-entity. He, he became a state senator in Springfield, and that, that's basically a talking shop. They don't do much, right? But then in 1992, before he became anything, um, a woman named Betty Lou Saltzman discovered him. Um, and Betty Lou Saltzman is the daughter of um, Philip Morris Klutznik, who was the president of the International Order of B'nai B'rith. So he's at the highest level. I talk about that hierarchy. He was at the highest level of the, of the Zionist secret society known as B'nai B'rith, who, who runs ADL. And, and well, Betty Lou Saltzman said in 1992 that Barack Obama will be America's first president, first black president. She said that. And then she, she with her father's money, he was, they're very rich, um, they got David Axelrod and Rahm Emanuel to basically shape Obama into becoming a political candidate. So he went into office in Illinois in the, in the Senate. And then in 2004, he was running for the US Senate. But he was an, he was an unknown person, really an unknown person in Chicago. Uh, and what was interesting, they were running for the seat of a guy named Senator Fitzgerald who was leaving the Senate. So the seat was, the seat was open, the seat was, the seat was vacant. But in, in the Republican candidate, uh, had a sexual problem, impropriety of some sort, and he pulled out of the race in June of the, of the election year. So Obama was the only candidate running for the U.S. Senate seat. It was a one-man race. And this is not the first time that Obama won a one-man race. All of his races have been like one-man races. You see? And, 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 and yeah, and this, yeah, that's the same, thing, same idea. Same idea. S exactly. Same idea. They run, they run a straw-man candidate like Dukakis or McCain. You run a guy who, who couldn't get elected dog catcher. And, and it's, like, it's like John Ashcroft was the same. John Ashcroft, who, became, who, who was the attorney general when 2001 happened, um, he had lost a race in Missouri against a dead man. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, this is, this is the problem we have, is that our, comp our, system, our political system is completely corrupt. They select the candidates, and then, and then they, they bubble up through the media, and they say, oh, look here, we have Jeb Bush and Hillary Clinton, and over here we have Rand Paul. And it's like, where do these people come from? The media creates them. They come up through these same channels. And then, and then it's like you say, oh, so democratic, so democratic. We, I, have, I have, you know, bad and worse to choose from. Yeah? And, and, and that's how it works. And then, and then they control these voting machines. This is where I really entered, pol when I first entered uh, writing about this in 2000, I wrote an article in 2000 called, the death of democracy or may the, best may the best hacker win. Because I had worked for IBM and I wanted to be an election judge to earn you know, a little bit of money on election day. And they showed me this machine that they said, and we, at the end of the night they said, we just put the punch cards through there. And I said, well, how does the machine communicate? This is a modem in the machine. And I said, well, what kind of security do you have? And they, they said, we don't need Mr. Bowling <laughs> to be a judge. And I, so I began investigating this. And, and I found out that the 512K cards were being produced by a guy from the Ukraine. Not Panasonic, not Sony. Some, some gangster on the west side of Chicago, a Jewish guy from Ukraine. And I called him on the phone and I said, you know, you make the 512K card, which basically runs the machine, collects the data, gives the commands, everything. It's like the brains of the machine. And, he, and I said, well, you know, how did you get the contract? He said, well, there was a little problem with Sony and Panasonic, so I got the job. And, and, and I wrote the article, and I said, well, I want you to read this article I'm writing for the paper. I've, I've written all about this machine and the problems with this machine, electronic voting machine. And I, I sent, him the, 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 sent him the thing, the, the article, and he called me back. And he says, you know, you can't print this. He said, 
you know, he said, I don't want any trouble for you and your family. But, you, you, I mean, this is, this is the kind of, you know, he was giving me like basically a threat. And I went ahead and published it, and I called the police, and I said, I got a threat from this guy, this whatever his Ukrainian name or Russian name. But, I mean, th that is, that's the thing, is that our, the, the political parties are controlled. The, the way that the political um, news is conveyed to the people is controlled through the media. And the voting machines are controlled. It's all controlled by private industry. So we are like, we, we are led to believe that we're, we're in a democracy with a free press when the evidence shows that we have neither. So we, we're in a very serious situation. We're in a very serious situation. And since 9-11, the situation has just gotten that much worse because now it's intolerable. I want to say one thing. I yeah. called, a, several weeks ago, I called um, our chief of police yeah. because someone had told me that they saw tanks, the uh, tanks that can go over mines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, MRAPs. MRAPs, yeah. two of them, yeah. and uh, some other, uh, so I called him and I said, what about that? He says, oh yeah, but we're never going to use this. Mm -hmm. I said, really, what are, what's the uh, criteria for that, yeah. that you decide? Yeah. Oh, we've got it taken care of, we just have it, just in case there's a lot of, dr oh, really? Yeah. Well, we had an episode in our area yeah. where a young guy was videotaping on a private, on, on a public sidewalk, and you see the police officer punch him in the face, and then they call, said that he resisted arrest. Of course, old, of course. And we went <laughs> to see him to see what had happened. Yeah. And this kid, who's about 22, was absolutely terrified. Yeah, of course. And he's got a $5,000 bill, and he, it's just a nightmare. Well, I called the governor's office of Oregon, and yeah. I said, what's going on with this? Yeah. The governor doesn't have an oversight. This no. comes from Homeland Security, right. and he appoints what he calls a coordinator. Mm -hmm. And the coordinator right. sits there, and, and there's no oversight whatsoever. It's right. just, you want this? It's okay, here. And, the, and the taxpayers pay this. This is, it's like a, a revolving door of spending money, overspending. They can't even... It's like, it's like the Soviet Union. Because, you see, the, you, when, after 9-11, uh, Michael Sheratov, who was the man who was supposed to prosecute the crimes of 9-11, he was the assistant attorney general, and he's the one who oversaw the non-investigation. He's, he's, he's the one who oversaw the destruction of the evidence. He was supposed to prosecute the crimes of 9-11, and the FBI serves under him, and the FBI is supposed to provide him with the, with the evidence that he uses for prosecution. But as I said, there was no prosecution because there was no investigation. So when you see somebody holding up a sign, we demand a new investigation, you say, wait, it's not a new investigation. We demand an investigation. Right. It's like what they do in Florida. You know, they're counting the shed. We're recounting the vote. Wrong. You're not recounting. You're, you're putting out a facade of counting it in the first place. Right. The only thing that counted it before was some funky machine. When I was in Chicago last time, I, I attend these when I was still allowed to go to Chicago. I, 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 went to the, I, I go to where they're counting the votes in Cook County, which is Crook County. It's the most corrupt <laughs> county in Chicago. And, 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 and they know me there. They don't like me too much, but the, the guys that run it, they, they say, okay, you can go in and see how the votes are counted. And I was in the back room, and this was, must have been 2006, like a March special election, 2006. And um, I had just come back from Venezuela. My stupid paper sent me to go meet Mr. Chavez and try to get a million dollars. It was just to get me back in the States. But I went to this election, and these guys, these Venezuelan guys, are walking in the hallway and say, Hey, what are you guys? I just, you know, what are you guys doing here? And he said, I, I said, I just came back from Venezuela. What? Do you, and he says, Yeah, we're running the election. And they had this, this, uh, this, these Venezuelan company had taken control of, I think, it was Sequoia, at the time, Sequoia voting machines. And these Venezuelan guys were running the whole counting process in Cook County and across the United States, where Sequoia machines were being used. But I can tell you what they do is every election, like in Chicago, they change the machines. They change the machines every, so you can't, you know, you, is it ESNS or is it Sequoia or is it Diebold or who's, who's doing it today? And it's, it, they're doing it across the whole country like that. So our elections are completely rigged. You, if you want to have a proper election, you have to have the votes counted in the local polling place. So like, this is a voting, if, if we're a little district here, we had a vote here, we all cast our votes. The public is supposed to watch the counting of the votes for the local polling station. That's what gives an election transparency and integrity. If you, yeah, well, there's other problems, but, but this is how they do it in France, for example. And when you hand count the votes and you keep, the, you, keep, you keep the election simple, you're voting for president, you're voting for congressman, you're not voting for 180 80 judges at the same time, which is what they do in Chicago. 
And they say, oh, well, we have 180 choices on the ballot. There's no way we can count them. We have to have the machines, you see? It's a, it's a it's catch-22. Yes? So um, you've been working on this for a long time, and you have a lot of good information. But now just think about what we can do about this. Right. So, so for an individual, what would be a good thing that you could recommend? And also for the whole movement as a whole. Right. The first thing is we have to use our critical thinking, and we have to be informed. Now, I can tell you that I've been a part of the 9-11 Truth Movement since its inception, in the very beginning. And I was not allowed to speak because of the nature of my research. Because I pinned the tail on the donkey, I couldn't talk. And I, you know, for, for, it wasn't until like 2004 when I was in New York City when Jimmy Walter was doing a thing that one guy freaked out, they needed another guy, said, put Bolin up there. And that was like the first time I was speaking to a large audience about, you know, because the Israeli, the Israeli role in 9-11 in this country is taboo. It's taboo. It's taboo to criticize Israel in any way, shape, or form. When Judge Goldstone, who was a Jewish judge from South Africa, when he criticized Israel in the, in the, in the Goldstone Commission um, for what they did in Gaza, he, he said, yes, Israel dropped white phosphorus and did crimes. He was, he was, he was threatened, and he recanted. So you can't, you can't do it. But what people have to do is they have to inform themselves, understand we've been deceived, then tell their friends, tell their neighbors, so that more people understand. Because I can tell you, I visited some of my relatives down in California the other day, and this guy's a smart guy, he's been a lot of places, and, and he, he believes the complete government version. He, he, he has not even thought outside that box yet. So you have to, people have to be informed, and when they get informed, they get organized, and they stand up against the liars. So would you, would you suggest that, since there's so much uh, backlash against you know, people you know, talking about Israel, to refrain from talking about Israel? No, 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 no. Israel is a country like any other country. And, and Israel, Israel does what Israel does. I mean, it's, it's, if, if Germans had done this, if Pakistanis had done that, would you refrain from talking about Germans or Pakistanis? You know. And if, if it, you know, the thing is that the Israelis use this card. They, they, they talk about it. They use this card. Uh, one of these Israeli ladies, uh, intelligence lady, told it to Amy Goodman one day. She says, well, it's very simple. If a European criticizes Israel, we, we, talk about the, we talk about the Holocaust. And when Americans do it, we say they're anti-Semite. He says, it's very easy. We do it all the time. And Amy Goodman's like, no. But that's, that's what they do. That's what they do. And, and so they, and what, what, they've, what also they've done is that people like Noam Chomsky and Amy Goodman are all, they have their following. The left, the Nation magazine. But they won't go near, they won't go near 9-11 Truth. They won't go near it. And what do we do like, beyond talking to our friends? We have to organize. We have to organize. And, and it's like, there, you know, one thing is we can do is like, like this man's running for Congress and, and support people that are running for Congress. He's running on, on a platform which is bound to be hammered down, though, because he's running on 9-11 truth. He's going to get pounded. You've got to run, I would say, run on the, the more palatable things like the local issues and keep 9-11 in your back pocket. I, if you show your card, your 9-11 truther, they're going to ridicule you. You see, even, even Ron Paul, Ron Paul now supports me a little bit. He's, he's read my books. I sent them to him. But remember, in South Carolina, he, he made fun of the 9-11 truth movement when he was in the presidential debate. So, but we have to organize. And we have to push for 9-11 for truth because 9-11 is the Achilles heel of our whole problem. It is the Achilles heel. It is, it is we have to be tenacious in, 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 in demanding the truth because... It's the gateway. It's the gate, but it's, it's the Achilles heel. You, 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 they can't get away with it. It's mass murder. It's, it's, it's terrorism. And we can solve it. We can investigate it. And we can solve it. And we can expose the people behind it, which is what I've done. And, and, and then you can just peel off the layers of deception. You see, when you understand 9-11, when you understand who's behind it, everything else makes sense. It all fits in place. Yeah, it can all and, go down to what is one day. I mean, I think it's literally it one could. thing, like the Pope coming out. It could, and it may very well do, because I, was, I saw how the Soviet Union came down in a few months. Nobody was killed. The whole Soviet Union came crashing down in 1990, 1991, 89. In one day, the whole East Germany went away. In one day! And East Germans who had been shooting each other with West Germans were drinking, were drinking Jägermeister on the, on, the, on the ruins of the wall. And, so, and the Israelis had built a wall twice as high, four, four times as long, but it's just a wall. Is it, you know, the Palestinians if, and, and, and the Arabs, and we, we deserve better. We don't need to have this kind of nonsense, you know, bullshit that they've imposed on us. But you know, people are apathetic and they're just so full of fear, and when 
Yeah. Someone stands up front and says, okay guys, you got my back right, and they go, yeah, and then you turn around and they're gone. <laughs> but this room's got about like 40, 40 people in this room right now. So we have 40? So what are we going to do in this, you know, in the next week, among all of us who know about 9 yeah, what is the action that we're going to take? Okay, well, I would, I, would recommend, I would recommend, if you haven't read my book, read my book. <laughs> read, read this first book, read this book, read this book, and, and, and go to bullin.com and, 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 and get a grasp on the, on the whole thing. And you need that because you can't, if, you, if, you, if, you're, if you're not understanding how it was done, who's behind it, then you're still vulnerable to the Judy Wood theory and the, and the nuclear bomb theory. We're, we're all in understanding of, of, of the basics. Well, are we? Are we? Are we? You'll see. Well, you hope so, but maybe not. We have to see. I, I mean, just in response to that yeah. question, I feel like, you know, 9-11 is one avenue, but, you know, Israel is pulling all the strings. Yeah. We have to put pressure on Israel. Yes. We have to, like, do the boycott thing. Yes. We have to call out what's going on. We have to be in solidarity with the Palestinians. We're all Palestinians now. Right. I've been saying that for years. Now, the thing, the thing is about, like you said, about the boycott thing. That's very true what he says. The Israelis are, are, have no hinterland. They're, it's a little, little tiny country. And you saw that when, during the July, the July offensive in Gaza, one missile landed near the Tel Aviv airport, and the FAA shut down American flights. That sent up alarm bells, because then the people in Israel said, oh, no, are we trapped in this ghetto? Are we trapped here? And they were. And, and, and so who did they call? Mayor Bloomberg. Mayor Bloomberg got on the first plane to Israel, and, and he, there he is with Netanyahu arm in arm and say, yeah, Israel's the best, safest, most secure country in the whole world. And, and, and it's like Mayor Bloomberg is the main guy. He's the controller of, of New York City since 9-11. He has put the kibosh on any discussion. He has told those firefighters and policemen and city officials that if you, if you utter a word about 9-11 truth, we, we will arrest you, take away your pension, and prosecute you. That's how it works in New York. Wait, I have to ask this lady. This lady has a question over here. Let me get her a question. Yes. Yeah, I'm interested in stopping Hillary Clinton, and I'm um, interested in the connection with Ukraine, um, Victoria Newland, John yes. McCain. Um, I understand Victoria Newland's married to one of the CFO. Robert Cogna. Okay. She's, yeah, Mrs. okay. she's Mrs. Cogna. And, um, and I wanted to ask about Penny Pritzker as well. I'm okay. wondering what, how much of this is connected, because GMAC was mentioned in here okay. as well. And yeah. then she's here present, whereas John McCain has yeah. been following since him since I was a kid this in is Arizona, the and he shows okay. up in these conflict zones, so when he went to Ukraine, Victoria, Victoria Newland is choosing that senior. Yes, yes, yes. This is, this is the McCain book. This book was written in Phoenix, Arizona by a man whose name is Mel Rockefeller. He's the illegitimate son of Nelson Rockefeller, and he, has befriended, he befriended Jeff Gates, and, and this Rockefeller knows how it goes. He knows how this whole thing works. And, and Jeff Gates um, wrote this book. This is about McCain. He wrote it in Tempe, Arizona. And this talks about the criminality of, of John McCain and how, he, and, and how the whole thing works. How the whole thing works and, how, and McCain's role in it. So this, is, this book is also, this is a very interesting book, but it, I would call this also a very good understanding of who John McCain is. Because as you see, John McCain and Lindsey Graham are two senators that have never seen a war they don't want to get into. You know? But what you said about, about Victoria uh, Newland is very... Lynn is connected with <laughs> Yes, yes, but Victoria Newland is, is part of this Kagan family, these, these Zionist neocons. She's, as I told you, the Kagans gave us the Iraq war. They were, pushing, they were pushing Clinton to bomb Iraq, which he was doing every day, and the best he could. But then they, when, when the 2000 election came along, they were pushing for this war in which the United States would go into Iraq and occupy the country, whether Saddam Hussein was there or not. So the Kagan family, who brought us the war in Iraq, are now bringing us the war in Ukraine. And you know, I live in Europe, so when this was all happening, I watch Russia Today, and I watch all these other sources that you don't get here. But, but what's interesting is that there was, a, there was a, a scandal, because Victoria Newland was taped on a telephone call that was leaked, where she basically said, F you, about the European Union. Well. Okay, that, that's not the important thing she said. The important thing is that she said prior to that, she said that she chose, well, you know, she's talking to the American um, ambassador in U Ukraine, and she says, well, it won't be Klitschko, the big boxer, and it won't be the guy that runs the neo-Nazi party. It'll be Yatsenyuk. It'll be Yats, she said. 
So this is two weeks before the Israelis and the neo-Nazis overthrew, with, with guns, overthrew the elected government of Ukraine. She had chosen who would be the next prime minister. Did you say the Israelis? Yeah, yeah, you haven't read my stuff about Ukraine. You have to, you have to go to bolin.com and read what I've written about Ukraine. Because I wrote about it as an they snipers? What they did, it's very interesting. This is in the Israeli media, I mean in the European media. There, was, there, were, there were guys who were born in Russia and Ukraine who have gone to Israel. There's many of them, right? It's like a third of the population now. They are the most extreme Zionists. They have a party called um, Israel Betenu. Uh, Israel, our house. This is the Sharansky party. But these guys went back to Ukraine at this, at this time, and they led, these Israeli fighters from the Golani Brigade, led the, the neo-Nazis called Svoboda in the attack, in the attack against the, against the retreating forces, being shot from behind because the, the snipers were in the hotel. But the, the guys that were running the, the military operation, which overthrew the government, was a guy named, well, one of them was Delta. He's, he's, he, he's an Israeli. He has his code name, Delta. But later, the Israeli press revealed who he was. He's a rabbi. He's an Israeli rabbi who, who went over and, and led, because they needed to have people who knew how to, who, who, how to run an operation, a military operation. They needed some command. These other guys were just like Ukrainian kids. And I got to tell you one thing that's very important. The United States military government, U.S. military intelligence, creates in Eastern Europe neo-Nazis. They create these skinheads. I've seen it in Estonia. They did it in Ukraine. Because this becomes like a group of black shirts, a, a group of fascist kids, that they can like rent a mob. You need some action. You need to overthrow the government of Kiev. Get the black shirts. It's just like the 1930s all over again. And, and, and the United States, I've seen how they did it in Estonia. Estonia is a very small country right on the edge of St. Petersburg with Russia. And the United States has done exactly that in Estonia. I know it. I know the people who do it. And then now I see how they did it in Ukraine. They do it all across because the idea is with these, with these America doesn't, even these, even these neocons don't want a shooting war with Russia. So what do they want? They want tension. They want to create this tension so that uh, they don't care if Ukraine gets divided into two pieces, which is likely to happen. They just want to create a tension so that they can vilify Putin all the time. Mr. Putin's doing this. Putin's Hitler. Putin's doing everything wrong because they want regime change. They want Mikhail Khodorkovsky, for example. If Mikhail Khodorkovsky, the guy who spent 10 years in jail for corruption, if he becomes the president of, of, of Russia, the Zionists have it all back in their pocket again. All the wealth of Russia goes back to, to the Rothschilds and all those people who, who support this, this whole play. Same thing. They, they don't want a war with Iran. They just want to overthrow the regime. But in getting this, they're willing to take great chances. And they don't mind if a few thousand people get killed. It doesn't matter. It's like, hey, it doesn't matter to them. It's not their kids that are fighting. So it's really dirty. What, what they're, what, and the United States government completely was running the putsch that happened in Kiev. And that's what a lot of Americans don't understand. I was at an event in Davis the other day, and this man, this man argued, says, you came here to give facts, but what you're saying about Kiev, it's, it's not true. It's not true. Well, I'm sorry if Fox News hasn't told you this, or CNN hasn't told you this, doesn't mean that it's not true. Another question? Well, my mom is going to vote for, uh, my mom and her roommate and all those people are voting for Hillary Clinton, and I want to point out, okay. because we know the Ukraine well, and I want to point out the connection with Ukraine. Well, with, with, with Hillary Clinton, with Hillary Clinton, all you got to do is, is point out that Chaim Saban has given hundreds or at least tens of millions of dollars to the Clinton Library. And if you, and if you want to know who runs the Clintons, get a, a, donor, a donor list to their library. The war crimes is a war criminal today. Which one? That's which one? Yeah. Okay, right, right. Go ahead. Say again. Nobody cares war about she, she, she's a war criminal. Yeah, she's a war criminal. She's a, you're welcome. She's Not only is she a war criminal, you remember what she said, remember what she said about when, when they killed Gaddafi? Yeah. She, she joked about it. She, she joked about it. She says, we came, we saw, he died. <laughs> she's not well in the head. She's from Oak Park, Illinois. She's not well in the head. You know, all I can say is that, but, but the idea, they, they, they want to give us this idea that the only people who can run our country are either Clintons or Bushes. Well, what kind of country is this? You know, hereditary monarchy? She took the woman. Back there. Okay, you mentioned, you mentioned that uh, Silverstein yeah. was uh, involved with uh, drug running with the Clintons. Were you talking about Mena, Arkansas, or somewhere else? 
Um, that mean that that indictment, the Miller indictment, when? No, Mina, Arkansas. Yeah. Okay, Mina, Arkansas. Well, the, the Mina. Okay, the Clintons, the Clintons in Mina, Arkansas. That's all true. That's all true. And 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 the, the, that's the, their original sin. Nothing. You have to understand this. Nothing binds people more closely than a crime committed together. So the Bushes and the Clintons and the Israelis are all involved in this huge drugs import that was going on illegally in this country in the 70s and 80s. Like I point out, this, this, Israeli, this Israeli aircraft industry has a, has, a, has a production plant where they fix airplanes in Bogota, Colombia, of all places. What do they do? Yeah, they fix a wheel on a plane, and then they repair it again when it gets to San Francisco. Huh? And they, they take out the cocaine. And they've been doing it for years. And you see, that's the thing is that the, 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 this drug smuggling is where they get a lot, a lot of black cash to run these operations. And the, the, the Bushes are involved in it. The Clintons, it's their original sin. The Clintons have left behind them a trail of corpses in the hundreds. They're criminals. But just the fact that they're receiving millions and millions of dollars from an Israeli agent named Chaim Saban should be enough. But in this country, it, it doesn't work that way. I pointed out that the judge who was overseeing the 9-11 tort litigation in New York, there were 96 families who wanted to sue, you know, they wanted a, wanted a trial in New York to find out what happened to their loved one. They said, we don't want the government handout. The government handout, you know. They, we don't want the million dollars from the government handout. We want justice. There were 96 families who lost loved ones. And Ellen Mariani was the last one. And they wanted to know who dropped the ball took the lives of 2,000, 3,000 people that day, including their loved one. And they went into a tort litigation in the courtroom of Alvin K. Hellerstein in the South, Southern District of New York City. One by one, those cases were settled out of court. One by one, until there was no cases left. And the last one settled was Ellen Mariani's. So there's been, there's been no trial. But what I found out is that Alvin K. Hellerstein's son is a lawyer in Israel who went there in the year 2001 and he works for a law firm in Tel Aviv who represents the key defendant in the 9-11 litigation that his father is overseeing in New York. Now, because that's his son, that is a fundamental conflict of interest. You cannot have an immediate, like a daughter, a wife, husband, or son that have, that have connections to a defendant in your trial. That, that's automatically a judge, a judge should recuse himself from that and say, no, I can't do this. And I hammered on this, and I hammered on it. And I even told, I even told that Hans Luik in Estonia, I, I, I said, there will never be a 9-11 trial. And at that point, there were like 50 families left or something. And he couldn't believe me. And I said, sure, there will never be a 9-11 trial. And so he made a bet with the president of Estonia, this American CIA agent, Ilvis. And Ilvis says, there will be a bet. There will be a trial. And, and, and Luik said, no, there won't be. And Luik won. There was no trial. There will never be a trial. Imagine that in the most litigious society in the world, America. 3,000 people die on 9-11 and not a single trial. And the key defendant in the trial was an Israeli company, a Mossad company called International Consultants on Targeted Security. Now, I listened to Menachem, I listened to Gilad Atzmon. He was in this town the other day. And he's an Israeli dissident. And I always wanted to ask him, I always wanted to ask Mr. Atzmon, are you related to Menachem Atzmon? Because Menachem Atzmon is the owner of that company. It was the key 9-11 defendant. These are the people who, invest, who, who let the bad guys on the plane. Passenger security, they call it. If you go to any airport in America, the guys that run security are Israelis. Israeli company. So a company called Huntley USA was the company that was like, oh, letting the people on the plane, checking them. And that company is owned by ICTS, by this Israeli Mossad company based in Holland. The man who owns that company, runs that company, is, is, is like Gilad Atzmon's uncle. So I asked him, I asked him, Gilad, I said, Gilad, you know, what does Atzmon mean? And he says, you, you want to hear? It means fortitude. In, it means fortitude in Hebrew. But he, and he says, and I say, you know, I always, always wonder, are you related to Menachem Atzmon? He says, yeah. He says, that's very interesting. And he, he went on to say, he's also related to um, a guy named um, Yellen Moore, Nathan Yellen Moore, one of the founders of the Likud terrorist group in Israel. And he says, I'm also related to Janet Yellen, the Federal Reserve Chairman, because she's, she's related to the Yellen Moore family. Yellen Moore from the Likud and, and, and Janet Yellen are the same family. And, and, and there was one other in there. Livni. Yeah, then he said, Zippy Livni. He said, Livni, Livni, he said, is the same as Atzmon. It means the same thing. Zippy, Zippy Livni, who's the foreign minister of Israel, was foreign minister, is also a relation to him. So I, I felt like, I said, I said, 
I wanted to be polite, and I said, well, you know, Gila, now you can understand why you, why you do what you do. <laughs> and, and, and he said, he said he went, he's going up the stairs from that little pizzeria, he says, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of guilt. It's a lot of guilt. And I, I thought that was really amazing. That was worth, that, was, that made my whole visit to see Mr. Gilad Atzman worthwhile. And then went to a jazz club and he played jazz. But I mean, this guy, that's, I mean, Israel is a very small society. And if, you're, if you are at the top, of, if you're in that society, you're right at the top. Like I lived on a little kibbutz, Afakim, kibbutz Afakim in the Jordan Valley, right? This is all started by Russian Jews, Lithuanian Jews, right? Old, I knew them all. These old people, you know, they were, it's like an old geriatric house, you know, there were a lot of old people there. But the, um, it's interesting that the, uh, I, I, knew, I knew a lot of people, but the, the woman who's married to Shaul Mofaz, Shaul Mofaz is like the, one of the highest guys in the state of Israel. She's a kibbutznik from Kibbutz Afikim. So what I'm saying is it's a very small place. The whole, the whole, the whole country of Israel is like the size of, size of Riverside County, California. And it's, it's, it, they, they talk about a population of 8 million in their dreams. Five million of them living in New York and Florida and California. You know, and, and they never go home. I know them because I, my wife is one of them. And they go home to Israel only if somebody dies, somebody very important dies. They don't want to go back. They can't stand it anymore. It's for a secular Jew, for an Israeli secular who grew up in the labor kibbutz, they can't tolerate it anymore. Because the Russians run the place and the Orthodox Jews have taken over. And they don't like being told that they can't do this, they can't do that, because the, the, the only religion that is prevailing in Israel is the Orthodox Jews. Reform and conservative Jews, like my sister's Jewish. She's converted to Judaism, my sister. She has three beautiful girls and a husband. But because my sister had a reformed conversion in Israel, she's not a Jew, and her children are, are, would be deemed as bastards. Huh? What a state. What a state. And they talk about Israel being the savior of the Jewish people. You know how they got a lot of them there? How did the Iraqi Jews got there? In 1949, they needed more people. They needed people. They needed people. So what Mossad did, the word Mossad comes from Mossad l'Aliyah Bet, which means the Agency for, Agency for Illegal Immigration, basically. Aliyah Bet is Im illegal immigration. Aliyah Aleph is legal immigration. They needed people. And so what they did, they wanted the Iraqi Jews. They said, there's, 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 a, there's like lots and lots of Jews in Baghdad. They've been living there for a long time. Well, how do we get them to leave their comfortable life, their comfort zone in Baghdad, and come to Israel? What they do? They made their comfort zone a little bit uncomfortable. <laughs> they put bombs in the synagogues. Wow. Mossad put bombs in the synagogues in Baghdad, scaring the people, the Jewish people of, Bag of Baghdad in Iraq, to go to Israel. And they, in, 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 in Yemen, Michael Shertoff's mother was running an operation called Operation Magic Carpet. They went down there to Yemen, which is at the very southern, western, southern eastern tip of Saudi Arabia, a very poor country, very old, old, old Jewish community. And they basically went up to the sultan or whatever and gave him a few gold bars and say, give us your Jews. And he said, yeah, you can take them all. And they, they were treated like cattle. They were, they were round up, put on these planes. You can see pictures of them today. They're all sitting there in these planes. They've never been on a plane before in their life. And they, they, they're like people from the Bible, old, old people. And, 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 they're, and, they're, and they're being flown, and they're, they were being flown secretly into Israel. And, and you know who was running it? The, 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 the hostess with the mostess? Livia Eisen, Mrs. Shertoff. Michael Sheratov's mother. And then she settled, she, she and her husband, they settled in New Jersey and she ran an art studio. You find all these old Mossadniks running art studios in New York City. Studios. Any questions? Any more questions? More questions. You, give us a little background on ISIS and who's backing him and all that. Well, I, I, I think I kind of did that. ISIS, ISIS was created as a, a Sunni skinhead thing, you know, kind of like the same idea. They create these extremist groups that are based on either religion or race, and they, they wanted to create the Sunni group to act as a counterweight against Hezbollah, which is Shiite, and Iran, which is Shiite. So what they've been doing in Iraq, since we went in in 2003, we've been fomenting sectarian division. We've been, we've been our guys, and British guys, and Mossad guys, have been throwing bombs, just like that, like in Basra. They caught these two guys who were dressed up, they drove, they, they, they drove past when Basra was just being turned back to the Iraqis, they drove past this, uh, a protest and they sh shot machine guns at the protest and they got away. But the Ira Iraqi police went after them and caught them. And they took these guys and they unwrapped their turbans and they were British SAS guys. And they were dressed up like Shiites or Shiites. They were dressed up like militia. And, and their car was full of explosives and detonators. 
So they were gonna they were gonna park the car someplace, walk away, and blow up a whole market or something. And we've been doing this. This is what they've been doing for 13 years, or however long we've been in Iraq since 2003. Was it 11 years? Um, and, and, and because we've been creating this sectarian division, because we want to pull the country apart. So you want to pull the country apart, you have to pull it apart along its sectarian division. Shiite, Sunni, bomb each other. Kurds, bomb each other against this, so that you, you break it into three pieces. And that's, that's the name of the game. And so we created ISIS to be this, this like Al-Qaeda, new Al-Qaeda. And, and so now we've, they've created this force that we have to fight against, you see? We create the thesis, we create the antithesis to get the synthesis, and which is more war, more division, more arms being sold. More money. more money. The US defense budget was 300 million, 300 billion, sorry, big difference. 300 billion in the year 2000 until 2001, until 9-11. After 9-11, it doubled. It didn't go up incrementally, it doubled to 600 billion. And it's since, since 2001, it's been going up, 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 up. So now it's closer to a trillion dollars a year, just defense budget. That's not counting Homeland Security, anything. that's just military spending. And who's making the money? Look at Henry Crown from Chicago, the Henry Crown family from Chicago. They own General Dynamics, number three or number four defense contract in the United States any given year. They own Aspen Society, they own Aspen Mountain, they own a lot of things. They also own Barack Obama. <laughs> Barack Obama was the creation. In Chicago, they don't hide it. The Chicago Jewish Magazine is called Chicago Jewish World or whatever it's called. They had him on the front page. Obama, America's first Jewish president. They called him in because he was, he was put in power by the Klutzniks. This is just after he was elected. He was put in power by the Klutzniks, the Pritzkers, you said, Hyatt Regency, and the Crowns. These people all have a vested interest in, in Barack Obama. So people who hope and pray that Obama's going to like grow up and break the shackles and, 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 and stand up against Israel. You know, I was listening to that speech today. Is he going to say it? Is he going to say it? He's going to say it. He's not. He, he, but they're hoping that it's a vain hope. He's not going to. He's not going to break the, break the chains or, or leave the hand that feeds him. He was created by these people. He's what you would call in Hebrew, what you would call in, in Yiddish, a golem. He was, he was put together, a man created out of mud to serve the Jews, and like a Frankenstein. They create, the, it's from Yiddish, Yiddish history, you create this, this being like a Frankenstein, make it alive, and he serves you. That's, 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 that's I wrote about it. Barack Obama, the Golan. A question, please. So I'm ignorant. No, you're not. And, um, you know, yeah. less ignorant than most of the people I know. Okay. But I don't understand, like, six million Jews right. being, uh, you mm -hmm. know, killed. And then we establish Israel yeah. to compensate. Yeah. So uh, what happened? Okay, now that's, I, I can't get into all the Holocaust stuff because that's a, very, that's a very sensitive subject, but I can say this. The Zionists and the Nazis are two sides of the same coin. There's in fact, there's in fact a medal, a Nazi medal, where on one side is the Star of David and the other side is the swastika because they, they were working together. Hitler, Hitler believed, and the, the Nazis believed, that the Jews are a race that has to live apart from other races. And he felt the same thing about the Germans that the Germans are a race that have to live apart from other people, that these are like pure races. This is his racism ideology. And, and this, this is exactly what the Zionists believe. If you go to Israel and you, you say, I'm coming back on the law of return, you have to prove three generations of matriarchal descent as a Jew. If you can't do that, you're, not, you're, 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 all, you're immigration B, not immigration A. I always got immigration B stamped on my passport. But I mean, that's the thing is, and the Zionists were working hand in glove with the Nazis. There was, the, there was all kinds of transfers and things. So, so money was being transferred and Jews were being transferred from Germany to Palestine. But you, this, the thing is that the Zionists wanted the same thing that the, the Nazis wanted. They wanted to create a, a state where only Jews would be living. You see, Nazism fell down in 1945 and went away, basically. But Zionism has gone on and on and on its merry way. And, and, and Americans are supporting now a state where you, where you have to prove three, three generations of linear matriarchal, I mean, uh, linear d uh, ethnicity of being a Jew. This is very un-American. Why would we support an a, 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 a ethnic state where, where, which is chauvinistic and racist? It makes no sense. We as Americans should be supporting the idea of one man, one vote. Huh? 
This is what we stand for. So it's the motivation with the Israelis to do what they're doing. They want to create this state. They, 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 they have, the, I, I'm trying to tell you, they have this idea. Zionists have this idea of Jewish supremacism. If you want to understand better about Jewish supremacism, you should read Israel Shahak's book, 3,000 Years of History, Jewish History, Jewish Religion, 3,000 Years. He, he talks about the basic beliefs of Zionists what they're taught in the schools, what they're taught in the yeshivas, what they're taught is that Jews are superior to other people, which is not far from what Gilad Osman was saying the other night, if you saw him speaking. He drew a bell curve and showed how, how over here the Jewish elites are smarter, and here over here were the, the white elites, and over here were the blacks and Hispanics. And on his bell curve, the smartest of the smartest were Jews. And, and I'm thinking, did I come here to listen to a man tell me this kind of stuff? You know, but this is what they believe. They believe that they're superior, and that, and that, and that non-Jews have no service other than to serve them. And this is a whack belief. This is outright crazy. But this is what people like Benjamin Netanyahu firmly believe. They believe that God's chosen people. Also, that's what I mean. This is all, this is all bad religion. You know, to believe that you're better than other people, that you're supreme, and that you can dictate to other people how the world will be. This is sick. You know, we didn't get rid of it in 45, though. It's still alive and living well in Israel. Yes? You mentioned the divide and conquer as a strategy. It's been a long time. Wait, right? say that again. History. Then you talk about a little bit about the balkanization oh, of yeah. the various parts of the country. And in this country, yeah. you hear increasing talk about succession, various states leaving the Union and so forth. And I see that gaining steam as part of this balkanization. Your comment, please. You balkanization in this country? So, with the yeah. successionist movements to break up this Oh, yeah. Well, well, this is, this is the, there's a couple things going on in this country that are right out of the Soviet playbook. One is this, as you said, the balkanization, breaking up countries along ethnic statelet lines. Now, you see, if Israel, if the Oded Yinon plan, that's what it's called, 1982, Israel Shahak translated it for um, non-Hebrew non speaking people, that the Israeli strategic plan was to break up the big countries in the Middle East and break them up into ethnic statelets like Yugoslavia, right? right? Now, in that way, they would succeed because all the other states around them would be weak ethnic states like Israel, except that Israel is not weak. So then Israel would be the most powerful of ethnic states, and it would give legitimacy to the Israeli racial state because all the other states are based on tribal lines, you see? You're Sunni, you're Shiite, you're, you're Kurd, you're this, you're that. We're Jewish. Jewish states, bigger than you guys. And the other thing about what's going on in America today is this open border with Mexico. Now, this is, this is exactly what the Soviets did. In the Soviet Union, they, they, they moved people around a lot. <laughs> Stalin, you know, they moved them around and killed them a lot. But they, 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 they fostered Russian immigration, ethnic Russians, to all these other little, little states like Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, etc., Ukraine, um, in, order to, in order to weaken the national flavor of those countries. So that Estonia and Latvia have like half Russian speaking people. That's what the legacy of the Soviet Union did. That's what they're trying to do like in California. What's that for? Uh, a, book? a book? Okay, thanks. And, and that, that the, the, this weakens the, 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 the moral fiber and weakens the structure of the society. You remember, it, 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 it's, it's like, so now we have, I'm riding on the MAX train today, and everything they say something in English, and they say something in Spanish. It's like, you see, so they, they, they're, they're trying to weaken the sense of, of who you are as Americans, that now you also have Spanish. And in Chicago, they do it in Polish. And the, so that, you know, this sense of who, what are Americans anymore? You're just like a minority in your own country. And it's to weaken the fiber of the country. And that's why patriotic people say, wait a minute. We can't just have open immigration. We can't just let everybody who comes here be a citizen. You have to go through the ropes. You have to go through the... Everybody else did. People came to Ellis Island. People were quarantined. People went through the normal process of becoming citizens. Or they, you know, but, but, but now they, they want to swamp the country with all these people from South America and, and Latin America. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a ploy, it's a ploy to weaken our state. And don't forget NAFTA, which plundered our country. And you know who, and you know who got NAFTA pushed through Congress? Rahm Emanuel. Rahm Emanuel was, was Clinton's right hand, and he takes credit for single-handedly pushing NAFTA through this way. Yeah, well, coming, really 
well, this is the thing. But you have to ask yourself, why would a labor president like Clinton, Democratic, why would he sell out American he's labor? Never on labor. He was never on right. labor. He's a fascist bought by Washington. There you go. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I just wanted to, you know, she, a little history on Zionism. When they were having their first Congress in, in the 1890s, and they wanted, they spoke of a colonial home for the Jews, a colonial. Yeah. So it wasn't religious. It was going to be a colonial enterprise. And they're originally talking about uh, Uganda, Argentina, yep. Haiti. Palestine was one of five yep. areas that they had located. But even back in the 1890s, and this precedes Hitler, World War I, they were talking about removing the indigenous population by force right. if necessary. They were never going to live with or amongst the indigenous population. Right. So all you hear about this war against Islam, the clash of cultures, that is all spin. They were never, never going to live amongst peacefully. Right. And if it had been in Uganda, we would have been hearing about the, how horrible the Ugandan people are. Let me add something to that. You're talking about this uh, uh, the real Zionism. There was a group called the um, New Zionists. That's revisionist Zionism. That was created by a guy named Vladimir Jabotinsky. And Jabotinsky, he is the father of the Likud party, basically. He's the ideological founder of revisionist Zionism. And you know who his secretary was? Mr. Netanyahu. Ben Zion Netanyahu, Milikovsky from Warsaw. And they came to New York. They actually ran in, it was running out in New York. The new Zionist organization was based in New York City. Actually, Jabotinsky died in New York City. And when he died, Ben Zion Netanyahu became the head of the revisionist Zionism. Now, what was Jabotinsky's claim to fame? He, he writes, uh, in 1923, he wrote a book called The Iron Wall. He said that we have to build an iron wall between us and the Palestinians. And in 2002, what did they start building in Palestine? The Berlin Wall. This is, this, like you said, this is an ideology that has been mapped out 100 years ago, and we're seeing it come into effect now. It's completely racist. It's completely segregationist. It's complete apartheid. Anybody who goes to Palestine, Israel, will see apartheid. But if you're an American Jew, you probably only go to Tel Aviv, you go along the, the tour route. You don't go to Bethlehem, you don't go to Hebron, you don't go to the West Bank, you don't go to Gaza. The last time I went to Gaza was like 1991. I went with the Archbishop of, of my church, the Anglican Church, a good guy from Texas, and he said, he said, when you go back to America, you tell the people in your church what you've seen here. I tried to. People in my church didn't want to hear it. In Santa Cruz, they didn't want to hear it because they had formed an alliance with the local synagogue. And so our churches have been completely compromised. You know, that, 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 oh, the Jews say, no, you don't want to talk about anything about Israel. That, that wouldn't be friendly for our little Santa Cruz relations here, would it? <laughs> Question, sir. Well, Chris, I want you to talk about, you know this so well. There are only 15 to 16 million Jewish people in the whole world. In any city you go to, they lead in the arts, mm -hmm. they lead in politics, yep. they lead in banking, they lead in, in law. Yep. Uh, how do they do it? How do they do it? What, they, there is something. I'll tell you, it's very simple. It's very simple. You know, all this stuff is simple. It's really, really very simple. The way it works is that if, you are a, if you're an institution of government or if you have a company or what have you, and you promote and, you, and, and a Jew winds up getting in a position where he can make choices, and the choice comes between um, an American white guy, an American black guy, and a Jew, who thinks could get the job? The Jew. All the time. So if, if it's in a hospital, or if you're if in a law firm, or in the legal practice, you, you'll hear, talk to doctors about it. They'll say, it's, yeah, it's amazing. The only people who get promoted are Jews. And, but they know that they shouldn't talk about that. That's like anti-Semitic. They shouldn't say that. But they see, it's not fair. Is it's not fair. The arts also? Everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. Yeah. It's everywhere. So it's like, if you just read this history, like, about, like World War II, for example. In World War II, we had a great... Uh, material effort, you know, everything was being bought and sold. You know who was running it in the middle of Chicago? Henry Crown. He was the main procurer. He, he, had, he had been in that business of selling grain and, grain and I mean, gravel and stone to the city of Chicago. So he ma started making these deals where billions of dollars are being transacted, and he's buying all the stuff the American military needs. Who do you think he's buying it from? He's buying it from other Jewish guys. They, so they help each other. That's, that's this organization. They, and they always, they, always, they, they always pretend like, oh, we're trying to help everybody, but they're helping each other. And that's, that's how they have risen to these positions. It's not competence. It's not merit. 
Michael Sheratov, Michael Sheratov wasn't assistant, secretary, uh, assistant attorney general because of his merit. He is a traitor to the country. He destroyed the evidence of 9-11. What merit is that? He's a criminal. But he is not being prosecuted because he's protected by this whole Jewish network in the media, in the, in the, in the De Department of Defense, Department of Justice. How do you prosecute the number one prosecutor in the nation? How do you prosecute the attorney general? Huh? That's the problem we have. And they control the whole US government that way. And it, it might be not the first person, for example, um, John Ashcroft was number one guy. He's the guy you see in the picture window, right? But, but Michael Sheratov was number two, and he's the one who made the decisions. That's, 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 the, that's the way it works. It's very simple. Yes, ma'am. Can you um, speak to uh, the influence of um, pornography, the, in, in, the demoralization of the country uh, with uh, pornography and the infiltration of... Um, Academia yeah. with uh, garbage yeah. Um, yeah. education. It's 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 what you're talking about is is the whole cultural war. Our country has gone through Western society, America, Canada has gone through a cultural genocide, and they, they what they want to do is they have to they have to demoralize the people to the point where the people no longer care what's true or what's false. That's where we are today. And so they have demoralized us to the point where the truth doesn't even matter for most people. You know, look at how many people have come to this event tonight. But there's many, many more that should be coming. There should be much more interest in this because, but unfortunately, we are fighting against a, a, a huge ocean of apathy and demoralized people. And, and that's tactical. And of course it is. It's like, and, they, and they, 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 every perversion in the book becomes okay. It's okay to pierce yourself and to have tattoos and tattoo your neck. And I live in Sweden, where in, in a little town in Yunshipping, I go to the sauna, the swimming pool, and you see nice girls and nice men, all like under the ages of like 40. They're loaded with tattoos, like got all this bad ink. They look like a gangster from Fresno. It's like, <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Where did you people start getting this from? The last time I saw such tattoos, it was like, you know, in LA County and Fresno. This is what the gangsters, and it's like they have, they have celebrated this gangster fashion to become the fashion of Europe and America. It's, it's sick, but this is the power of the media. You glorify, you, you glorify some perversion. You say it's okay, it's cool, and if you don't think it's cool, it's something wrong with you, not with, not with the perversion. There's also, um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, Zionist history and... Uh, Slavery and, and sex trafficking yeah. as well for yeah. the purposes of uh, sex, yeah. sex trafficking for, for black males. Oh yeah, and oh oh yeah, and 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 sex trafficking in Israel is huge, and it's it's huge in, in, in Germany too. Among among the, the head of the Jewish the head of the Jewish community in Berlin in, in Germany, his name was Friedman. He was imp he was having two young fifteen year old girls from Ukraine sent every week for his pleasure, and then just dismissed. And, and, and it was exposed in the German media, but do you think they made a big deal out of it? No. And in Israel, it's a huge, they have, they import these girls from Ukraine. Ukrainian girls are very, you know, kind of nice girls and, and poor. And they bring them in from Romania and Ukraine, and, and they take away their passport and put them in these brothels where they have to work for like years before they can even get out again. And, and, and this, is, this, is, this is where we're at. This is what Israel does. And, and another thing that's very seldom talked about in this country is Jewish perversion among kids by the rabbis and by Jewish leaders in this country. And it's like, they'll always point the finger at the Catholic Church, but you know, whenever it comes up, whenever they find something about the Jew, in the Jewish religion, it's, it's maybe mentioned once, very lightly, and suppressed. So the, the sexual perversion among Jews and in Israel, it's rampant. It's rampant. It's also written about, it's like sanctioned. Yeah, I know. It's right. sanctioned. It's not That's just right. a, That's right. a perversion. That's right. In, in the Talmud, you're getting, you're getting into some religious stuff. She's talking about the, the Talmud. The Talmud is the rabbinical interpretation of the Torah. Now, that is the main thing. That is the law in Israel. It's not what the Torah, it's not what the Bible says. It's not what the first five books of the Bible says. It's what the rabbis say about the first five books of the Bible. This is called the Babylonian Talmud. And this is, this is the interpretations of, of Jewish rabbis like from the time of Christ until later. These are the people that Jesus Christ was really railing against. These are the Pharisees and the scribes. And he says, you have corrupted my father's temple, etc., etc., etc. These are the people he said, 
you do not know the truth because you are the sons of, the, of, the, of Satan. You only know lies. This is, this is what Jesus Christ was up against. This is the people he was, he was fighting against. And, and, and that's, that's what is in controlling today. And as you say, they sanctioned, for example, you can do to a, a non-Jew whatever you want, basically. Israel Shahak begins his book. I'll just finish. Israel Shahak's book, Jewish History, Jewish Religion, a story of 3,000 years, something like that. It's a very good book. I highly recommend it. Um, I, know, I knew Israel Shahak. He, he starts out, the beginning of the book is that he was in Jerusalem one day, walking on, on, a, on a Friday night or a Saturday, the Sabbath, and, and obviously a man had, heart, had a heart attack in the street. There was a man dying in the street, and he must have been in the Jewish quarter. He went to the house right there where the man was dying, and, not, and he knocked on the door, and it was an Orthodox observant Jewish man answered the door, and Israel Shahak said, uh, please, call, call an ambulance. This man's having a, a heart attack. And the Orthodox or the Orthodox Jew said, well, is it a Jew or not a Jew? And, and, and uh, Shahak said, well, it's a Palestinian or it's a, not a Jew. And, and the Orthodox Jew said, no, I can't call because I can't break the Sabbath for a dying Gentile. You see, but because in, in their religion, everything is based on race. The, all the whole history, the whole country of Israel is based on race. There are laws for Jews and there are laws for non-Jews. And, and it goes all the way down, as you said, to abusing children. Like, I don't want to talk about that. It, all things are included. All things are included. The, the, the Talmud is like that long. Books and books and books and books and books. Please. So, uh, in answering the question earlier, you spoke of uh, a strategy of balkanization in the Middle East and other places. But yeah. then what sounded like an opposite strategy or something, it, 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 separating uh, religions and peoples in the Middle East and then but terrible things happen in the U.S. somehow also no, okay, yeah, created by Israel that is about mixing. Yeah, so no, the, 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 yeah, well, that's, those are two different, two different things. He brought up balkanization and he wanted to know about immigration. So those, I just addressed those two questions in the same, in the same, so in the same thing. So no, terrible either way? no, no, balkanization is the Israeli strategy for the Middle East. To, to, to divide all the big secular countries like Yugoslavia into ethnic statelets, which is what they did in Yugoslavia. So the great big country of Yugoslavia, which was a very dynamic socialist country, is now seven poor little countries. This is the, this is the Israeli plan for all the countries like Iraq, Lebanon, etc., etc. Break them up along, like Sudan. You, you, Sudan, they, 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 yeah, yeah. No, and then, and then he also brought up the question of immigration, so I dealt with that. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but what we're talking about is, is balkanization. Any more questions? Anybody? You, you ma'am. No, I just wanted you to speak. Um, I know you mentioned Israel and Zionism as the puppet master, and Bush and Obama, I assume, were like, you know, the, the puppets. <laughs> and I'm just wondering to what degree you feel they're aware of and complicit in what's in that agenda. Well, that's a very good question. Um, with the Bush family, the Bush family comes from obviously an American blue blood family from the East Coast. They were involved in drug smuggling way back when, back in the days of China. Okay, so the Bush family is a criminal family that has long, 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 long tail. I mean, Papa Bush, his, his father was involved with the Nazis. So I mean, you know, the, the Prescott Bush. So the the Bush family has a, a long history of criminal and treacherous, treasonous behavior in the United States of America. Obama, on the other hand, does not come from such a heredity. We don't know who his father is. Or I don't know if we do know or don't know. But we don't even know where he's born. I mean, this is a very, very, very strange thing. But Obama is, is, does not have that, that big family behind him with all that history. Obama is just like the, the puppet. He's just the puppet. And it was very, very clear from the very beginning because when, when, he, when he speaks, when Obama talks, you just watch. He looks at this teleprompter to that one. To this one, to that one, and he reads very well. You know, he 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 does a great job. He does a great job, but but when he's not, when he doesn't have the teleprompters there, he can't answer any questions. I saw that in the very beginning. He was in Egypt or someplace, and or Poland, and and the teleprompter wasn't there for the kids asking questions. He couldn't say anything. But but so Obama knows he who created him. He knows who he owes. He knows who supports him. Obama's Obama's wife, for example, her brother. Is a Jewish has a one of those thing, those black Jewish groups that that say that they are you know the, in Chicago there's these groups that say that they are black Jews and they want to go to Israel live in Israel. Uh, Mrs. Obama's husband or brother 
is, is ahead of one of those, those, re, those churches, those synagogues. So it's like they, they saw this was a guy they could control, manipulate, and use. And he knows it. I'm sure he knows it. He does what he's told. What is the difference between the FBI and the CIA? Very good question. The FBI is the Department of Justice. It is the sub-agency of the criminal division of the Department of Justice. And its job is, like when 9-11 happened, 9-11 being an act of terrorism was um, given directly to the FBI and the Depart criminal division of the Department of Justice to prosecute because it's a crime of terrorism. That means it fell right into the hands of Michael Sheratov, our Israeli Assistant Attorney General. Now, Michael Sheratov also happened to be the one who prosecuted the first bombing in the World Trade Center in 1993. He was then the attorney for the uh, state of New Jersey. So that's when the blind shake and all that stuff, remember? And, and the, FBI had, the FBI had made the bomb that went off. It was, this, is, this is from the New York Times. And the FBI had, was giving Colonel Saleh, the Egyptian guy, $1 million to like basically run the whole thing. So this is what the FBI does. The FBI is in the business of creating crimes now, creating false fight terrorism. There's a whole score of them that they run. What they do is they basically find some, some poor Muslim kid or some poor black kid. You know and they, and they, in Portland? What? Are you aware of the situation here in Portland? No, but I'm, they yeah, do it here too. Yeah. Yeah. The young kid. The Christmas tree ball. ball. Oh, oh yeah. Christmas, yeah. Seven. They do it all the time. They do it time and time and time again. And it's like, so the FBI is clearly an agency that's way out of control. And the CIA, the CIA is this agency that nobody controls. It's supposedly under the president. But is it? I mean, they, and they get, we, we, we give billions of dollars to the CIA to run this, this operation. And it's like, I just bought the book today at Powell's Books, uh, Kill the Messenger, about how, about how Gary Webb revealed that the CIA was involved in bringing all this crack cocaine into LA and San Jose and California. And then, and then he was, you know, the, his editors wouldn't stand by him and he wound up killing himself or was killed. But in any case, this is the thing, is that the, the CIA and the FBI are agencies that are completely out of line. But CIA most, like a fourth branch of government. yeah, but what it, it shows you, it shows you, it shows you the level of corruption of our government today. You can, just can't get away from it. We need to have a complete house cleaning. In this country. Michael Hastings yes. was a journalist. Yes, I know. And his car blows, you know, his engine blows up 200 feet behind. Yeah. And they say that he had a traffic accident. Well, what they did, what they did is it's just like 9-11. The planes that hit the World Trade Center were remotely controlled. The, the, the Malaysian Flight 370 was remotely controlled. Uh, uh, flight 990, Egypt Air Flight 90, went up and down, up and down in the ocean, was remotely controlled. Cars can be driven in the same way. When they wanted to get rid of Jürgen Heider in Austria, they just made his car increase the RPMs, decrease brake function, bye-bye Jürgen. Same thing they did, because our cars today, these modern Mercedes, these modern cars, are just computers on wheels. So, and there's no defense at all. So if you're driving that car, if somebody over there has the computer and, doesn't, and, and knows those, those connections to your car, they can do exactly that. So you better drive a bicycle. <laughs> Any more questions? One question here, sir, Mr. Chandler. Uh, if we grant all the bad stuff that the Zionists have done and everything else, yeah. uh, who's to say that our own homegrown, the CIA, FBI, et cetera, aren't equally doing all that? Because uh, the Bush family has been, like, yeah. has roots back to the Kennedy assassination right. and so forth. Right. And supposedly the Bushes were involved even there. Right. So. Right. Uh, right. What what physical evidence or concrete evidence is there that just because the Israelis are doing all this stuff, right? Our our guys are doing all this stuff too. Right. That's a very good. How point. do you divide up who's doing that's it? That's Why good, do you conclude it's the Zionists rather than our own security? That's a very good question. Okay. Now that's the that's the uh, that's exactly like what we're dealing with with the CIA, for example. At the CIA and 9/11 was being run by the executive director of the CIA was a guy named Buzzy Krongord. Buzzy Krongord, his real name is Krinsky or something like that, Kring, Kring, it, 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 Polish name. But when they came to America, Polish Jewish guy, they, they decided to change their name to something like, sounds Scandinavian, Krongord. It's, they say Krongord. He was the, the operational, he was the guy who ran the day-to-day -day operations of the CIA. He was executive director, technically the third man on the totem pole. But that's exactly what I was telling you before, is that like, 
It's not the first guy. The first guy is just there for window dressing. And the second guy. But it's the guy, it's the people who make the decisions, the guy who makes the day-to-day -day operational decisions. That was Buzzy Krongard. Now, who was Buzzy Krongard? Not only was he running the CIA that day, but his former company, Brown Brothers, was the company that made all the put options. Like all, basically all those, those options on the, on the stocks that, that wound up, you know, on, but the planes were to hit the building and that the stock would go down, those bets were going through Brown Brothers, his former company. But now, who's, who's Buzzy Krongard? You might say, I thought at first, for the first couple of years, I thought, oh, some Danish guy or something. I, figured, you know, I didn't look into it too much. Then I looked into Buzzy Krongard a little bit later. I see that he's, he's, he's a Jewish man who wants to hide his Jewish identity. That should put up a yellow flag, because if somebody wants to hide their identity, there's a reason for it. And Buzzy Krongord, so I called him up on the phone. I talked to him. I said, you know, and I didn't get much out of him, but I sent him my books. I, I, let him, I sent him both books, so he should know. He can read out there on his big plantation in Maryland or wherever he is. He can read what we know about, about what 9-11. But this is how it works, is that these agencies have infiltrated our government at all these levels so that they, who's the mastermind of 9-11? That's what you have to ask. Who's behind it? And from the very beginning, I said, there's no way that this is an American plot. There's no way that Americans would do this. To their, would do this. It's just, it's just un-American. You know? Well, we don't, we don't do exactly like that. 9-11 is a very dastardly plot. We don't even pull things like that. There was a guy, there was a, a, one of the big investigators for the U.S. government said in the very beginning, he says, we've never seen anything like this except that this is, except in the Soviet Union. This is a very, very sophisticated Soviet plot, he said, or Russian, Russian style plot. Because it is, it's very convoluted, it's very complicated. Who did it? And I would recommend for people who, who want to get a little bit better idea about how these things work, read John Le Carré, his book, Little Drummer Girl. And that, that book was written John Le Carré wrote that book back in like 1982 when Israelis were invading Lebanon, and the head of the Mossad was advisor for the book. These these big guys in the Mossad were the advisors for this book, and and George Roy Hill made a movie about it called The Little Drummer Girl too. But if you watch the movie, it's very complicated. You, you want to understand? Read the book. It's very good, and it talks about how how the Mossad, for example, leaves a trail, a paper trail. It's a game in Germany where you leave this trail so that then the investigators come along and find this piece, and this piece, and this piece, and this piece, and Mohammed Atta, this piece, Osama bin Laden. It all goes, the, the trail goes to where the trail is supposed to go. You see? But it's all been carefully laid. All been carefully laid. And so like in Florida, what did we have? We had, we had Israeli guys, a bunch of Israeli Mossad guys living like one block away from the culprits, right? And what's interesting about this, the culprits like Muhammad Atta and all those guys is that they had all gotten duplicate licenses. Not a new license, not an, they had duplicate licenses this year. So that meant that <coughs> Muhammad Atta, for example, had his Florida license and somebody else had another Muhammad Atta license. So that's where you get all these interesting tracks being laid. So the, the Israeli guy who speaks Arabic and looks like Muhammad Atta goes out, goes to the strip club, leaves the Quran there, puts money in the little stripper's dress, and it's like this, and it says, I'm Muhammad Atta. See, here's my license, Muhammad Atta. And Muhammad Atta is sleeping over there in Daytona Beach or something. He doesn't know, but a trail is being left that will implicate him. And they all had duplicate licenses, all the guys in Florida. And, all the tra and it just so happens that all these guys also, most of them, had lost their passport like two years before, three years before. Uh, they lost their passport. So somebody else was using their identity and leaving a trail that would implicate them. It's simple. But, but if, you read, if, you read, if you read Little Drummer Girl, you see this is, this is just basic standard operating procedure for the Mossad. Americans aren't that sophisticated. We, 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 haven't, we haven't been playing these kinds of games. That's not our nature. Americans are very honest, good people, basically. All the ones I know. There's a few bad apples. But most Americans are very honest and good people. And that's why they, how they take advantage of us. They take advantage of our goodness, our naivete, and our trust in our fellow man. They're exploiting that, our goodness to rip, to rip us off, basically. Any more questions? That's one last question. This man here. Do you have any um, insights about the uh, Mumbai attacks of 2008 that we may not have heard? Not too many. Of course, it involved, it involved the Chabad. It involved the Israeli Chabad these, and, and, and that whole thing. It's, um, you know, it's just this, this, another false flag, like the, like the, the, the Nairobi mall attack. 
It happened in the mall. The mall was owned by Israelis. The, 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 it all began in an Israeli shop. And they, you know, these reports were they're very interesting. It's like these people were watching these shooters. They, they're watching the shooter. Then the shooter went into this uh, clothes store and came out dressed in different clothes and walked away. Huh? And that was, people saw that guy. He went into a shoe store. He was a shooter. He'd been shooting up the place. Then he went in back to the store and came out, changed clothes, no gun anymore, just went out with everybody else. This is typical false flag. It was done in Israeli. And the thing is that they do it, they, Israelis will only do this, Mossad will only do this in a place where they control everything. They have to, they have to that's why they did 9-11. They not only control the whole New York City and all the, uh, in, you know, the investigation, and Michael Sheratov's an agent, et cetera, et cetera. But they own the building. They own the place. They own the venue. They own the, the security company. They own every single aspect of it. Like if the Mossad is going to do a hit, like they did in Dubai, they killed that guy. There's like 30 people. There's guys walking with tennis rackets through the hotel. There's the, this girl, that girl. They're all Mossad. The, so the victim becomes not, you know, Kennedy was surrounded by shooters from like 10 different directions, right? That's typical Mossad activity. They, they have, you, you become completely surrounded. Everybody that's around you is Israeli Mossad. And so then it's just a matter of just killing you because there are no witnesses. Everybody's on the same team. Remember when they did that operation in Dubai, I think it was, or Abu Dhabi about a couple years ago? The, the, the page was full of the people involved. was like 30, 40 Mossad agents that had been captured on this closed circuit television. That's how they do it. Well, with that, I want to say thank you very much for coming. It's been a very successful event. Yo, thank you, thank you. 20 each, yeah. And, I, and, and, and I, I'm, I'm so glad that we have had such a wonderful crowd and no disruptions, eh? No, so what's there, what's there to be afraid of?